Please feel free to introduce yourselves by name and where you're calling from. Hassan Abdullah, New Orleans, Louisiana. Assalamu alaikum, Naeem Abdul Salam, Columbus, Ohio. Assalamu alaikum, William Safir, Atlanta, Georgia. Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad Alem Ali, Elsa Brenta, California, San Francisco. Assalamu alaikum, Ezekiel Abdullah from Atlanta, Georgia. Bashir Muhammad from Panorama City, California. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Winona Majid, Southern California. Assalamu alaikum, Al Zaid Muhammad, which said North Carolina. Assalamu alaikum, Arlene Elami, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Assalamu alaikum, Muhammad Yusuf from Sacramento, California. Assalamu alaikum. Ramjanine Amin, Columbia, South Carolina. Doula, New York. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Kareem Abdul Salam, Memphis, Tennessee. Assalamu alaikum. Shafika Abdullah from Atlanta, Georgia. Assalamu alaikum. Naima from New York. Nigga, my salam, sister. Keep those intros coming. If you haven't introduced yourselves, give us your name and where you're calling from. Amin Sharif, Charlotte, North Carolina. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. We can hear you. Oh, good. Rosetta Saeed and James Saeed calling from Virginia, Richmond, Virginia. Hope Excellent. well. Excellent. Bright, smiling faces. I love it. What's wrong with you other people who are shy and not opening up your cameras? <laughs> Thank you both for being with us. Some cameras just don't Our work. Pleasure. No, I know these people. Their cameras work. <laughs> uh, I, I can't. We can't see that we're even connected. But I'm glad to be here. All right. Well, when I send you the replay, you make sure that I have your email addresses, and uh, when I send you the replay, you'll see it right away, nice and clear. Okay. We're seeing you, and you both look healthy and happy, and that's a wonderful mercy from Allah. So thank you for being here. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Salam alaikum to everyone. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. All right, we're getting started in less than three minutes. If you haven't introduced yourselves, please do so. If you have access to your camera, flick it on for a minute, and then flick it back off. Salam alaikum, everyone. It's Executive Senior Instructor Brianna Hamid in Augusta, Georgia. Thank you, Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. It's Aliyah Amatula from Harlem, New York. I don't know if y'all heard me before. Harlem in the house. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. All right. Y'all, I'm just coming from this uh, conference called the Circle of CEOs. It's been awesome. Got some information to share with us. <laughs> All right, we'll work it out. All right. You didn't tell us who you were, though. <laughs> this is Wally Udine. This is here. So I, excited I, about yeah. your meeting. We need to know who you are in this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he's, I mean, somewhat, yeah. he's somewhat of a celebrity now, so he might not have had to introduce himself, but I know there's some new people listening in, so they want to know who you are also. Alhamdulillah. All right, beautiful. All right, so let's get started. Uh, let me mute out all of the callers. And I'm going to ask that you not interrupt me during the discourse, but we'll have hopefully some time at the end of what I have to say for you to ask some short questions or make some short comments. Give me just one moment. Okay. And as you can see, I have put my face in the place. And uh, we're going to begin, as always, with the Basmala, as it's called. And we give that to you in the words, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Translated properly, that means with Allah's signature, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. And the reason why I refer to 
the word signature as opposed to N-A-M-E, name, is first and foremost because Allah is not a person per se. Allah is what we are referring to at all times as our source creator. That source that is responsible for the creation of all of these minor forces that we see in human life and in anything else that has an energy signature attached to it. And that is the entire creation is nothing but energy. Allah is not energy. Allah is the source of that energy. So therefore, we're not referring to Allah by name per se, as though he's a person or, you know, he's a buddy of ours or, you know, you know, we sit in private meetings with Allah or that kind of thing. We have to break out of that primitive uh, connection that human brains have had with or in attempting to define the undefinable, who is called by title Allah in the Quran and called by other beautiful names, quote unquote, in previous scriptures. So we say, as opposed to saying with Allah's name, we prefer to say with Allah's signature. And we're saying the same thing. If you sign your signature, it's supposed to be your name. And your name is supposed to identify who you are. And that signature goes beyond just you giving your name, it's you giving your permission. If you allow someone to go into your bank as an employee in your company and withdraw funds or even put in funds to your company account, they have to do so with your permission. So your name in that instance becomes your permission and your permission is coupled with your authority. It's backed up by your authority. So can you see how the word signature is a much more potent word to use than just the word that we use to refer to each other? And that is the word name. What is your name, brother? What is your name, sister? You know, yeah, okay, that's fine. But Adam in the Quran was instructed by Allah to name all of the things. See, those are the things that have names, proper names that we call nouns in language now. Well, Allah is not a proper noun. The name, quote unquote, that we use, Allah is not a name per se. It is a signature that registers in every single minute thing that Allah has created. So the blade of grass has Allah's signature attached to it. The way the clouds are moving in the sky have Allah's signature attached to them. The way the rain falls and every single one of those billions and trillions of raindrops that fall, they have Allah's permission to fall in the way that they fall. His signature is written on those things in nature, giving them the permission to fall in all of the dry places that they may end up falling into. That's Allah's signature. So what makes this more significant, I repeat, is that we are operating now with Allah's authority upon us. Not because we're great, but because Allah is supreme in his authority. And we have no authority to speak of unless Allah gives us that small measure of authority to do only what he has conditioned and willed us to do. Anything operating outside of Allah's direct will has not been given the authority to act by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So instructor Bilal, how do we know what Allah has signed off on? as a signature. How do we know what Allah is in agreement with as an authority which gives us a particular level of limited authority to act in? Because he follows up that basmala by saying ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So it's with Allah's signature. Question, what is that signature? Ar-Rahman, the merciful benefactor. Ar-Rahim, the merciful redeemer. These are translations of Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim that were given to us by Imam Warathuddin Muhammad, 
about a decade or more prior to his passing from this physical life. While the rest of the world of scholarship was translating that as the merciful, the compassionate, the compassionate, the merciful, the merciful, the all merciful, the almighty, the beneficent. And they went through layers of interpretations which are not necessarily incorrect. They can be applied. But for our modern day situations and circumstances, I believe, personally speaking, that Ar-Rahman as the merciful benefactor and Ar-Rahim as the merciful redeemer are the most appropriate for the situations that we are currently dealing with. Why is that, Instructor Bilal? because it is perfectly in lockstep with the fitra. And the fitra represents mother nature. We'll talk more on her in just a moment. Salam alaikum. You told me to interrupt you, sir. I'm listening. So you, you said that uh, as noted about saying the shahada and your sense of forgiving, we found it in the Quran at 30, 30, 39, uh, verse 52 to 54, and most point out in the Quran that 3953 is evidence. However, there is no connection to substantiate this. You said that you had missed that and you wanted me to bring that to your attention. Okay, so because most people have no idea what you're talking about, and I have to scratch my head too, but to remember what conversation we had concerning that, I'm going to ask in the future that you wait until a law, meaning a change of subject or just wait until the end of the class because that's when the most people would have gathered and I want them to get the benefit of that research. But thank you. Excuse me. Sure. Not a problem. No, no, no. This is how we learn. This is a class. This is how we learn. All right. But please bring that back up at the end of what I have to say for the night before yes. we close out for sure. I appreciate yeah. it. I appreciate your research. Most of you who don't know Imam Adib Abdullah of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, you might not know that this man goes deep. When I ask a, a, a minor question, he brings me major answers. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's what you're supposed to be doing as a learner in the university online learning course. So thank you for that, sir. And I'm going to leave all of that in when I give back the replay because that's a, that's a, a learning moment for all of us, including myself. I need to take better notes on what I ask people to do. <laughs> all right. So let me continue. We okay though. I, I, I won't be out of step with any where I was going. All right. But I, I want to say that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the merciful benefactor and the most merciful redeemer, are actually clocked into Mother Nature by Allah. How is that? I would ask that you only entertain the idea of a baby, a newborn baby that's being born out of gestation within the mother's womb that baby is receiving merciful benefits. And I believe all of us would agree to that. The baby within the mother's womb and what is called the gestation is receiving all kinds of mercy from Allah. And remember now, Ar-Rahman is related to the smaller word called Rahma, which means mercy. And even the womb, the name for the womb in Arabic is Raham from the same root. Raham, R-A-H-M, plural, Arham. When Allah says in the Quran to have taqwa for the wounds that bore you, the word is Arham. So Rahman and Rahim both allude to mercy. Keep that in mind. But there are two levels of mercy that Allah shows. The first measure of mercy that is shown to all creatures that are born, meaning to all life forms that are born, is that while they are in gestation within their mother's bellies, and we're talking now about the mammals as opposed to other forms of life that are not necessarily born out of a womb, the mammals are the only creatures that are actually born out of what we call a W-O-M-B, womb which attaches them immediately to their mother's breast or what are called mammary glands. That's why we're called mammals because we attach ourselves immediately to our mother's mammary glands. Animals call them teats, T-E-A-T-S. Humans tend to call them tits, T-I-T-S. Not a bad word. 
if you understand consonantal connections and what letters mean. All right. Now, while in gestation, that growing embryo, which eventually turns into a fetus, and then a fully formed infant, at least formed enough to be given birth, and then it continues the rest of its growth outside of its mother's raham or womb. This is a beautiful science when you understand what Allah has done, is doing, and will continue to do for life forms on this earth. That mercy that the baby is being shown, I remember Imam Muhammad saying once in 1975 that if the if the baby were to be conscious in the womb of how the actual body is developing while in the womb, the baby would be in so much tremendous pain that it would not be able to take it. Its mind would just not be able to take it because the pain that doctors suppose that life form is going through, well, if you can imagine bones coming together, veins, <laughs> being able to have to circulate the blood and all of these different things, the cranium that's developing in that small container called the womb. And then the flipping around of that life form in the eighth you know, month, ninth month to be prepared for exit out of the womb. Imam Muhammad said that the pain involved in that would just be overwhelming. So look at the mercy because Allah allows that baby to be born and there's no indication that the baby has gone through any sort of traumatic experience whatsoever. That's benefactor because a benefactor gives without allowing necessarily the person who's being given to to know who the person giving actually is. You can be the benefactor of a poor child from a poor community who you send to college with your money because you've got it like that. But you always say to the person, don't tell that child it was me. I don't want to thank you. I don't need to thank you. I'm doing it out of the kindness of my own heart. So I become the benefactor, right? Now, you can let people know who you are if you want, but a lot of benefactors choose not to. They feel like they're blowing the blessing. Well, Allah is also acting in the role of a merciful benefactor because he gives and gives and gives to us while in the womb. And when we come out of the womb, we have no idea how we got here. <laughs> All we know is that we are here. And it takes the parents later on in the life of that child to remind that child of how it got here and the struggle that the mother had to go through and the pain and stuff she had to go and what the father has to do to keep a roof over the head if he's the one doing and all of those different things the baby has to be taught because the baby's conscious mind is a blank slate at that point a blank slate that needs to be filled through experience in the world the only thing that is not a blank slate is the information that Allah has encoded into that infant's genetic makeup. So the information that's in your DNA, RNA makeup, when you come here from birth, there's already reams of information within the genes. And the mother is not the one responsible for that. She didn't teach the genes that information. The father did not teach the infant, that information, how to suckle at the mother's breast, how to cry when in misery or in pain, how to learn how to do these different things that we take for granted, but uh, nobody taught the baby how to blink, and nobody taught the baby how to sleep and wake up. I mean, these things are inherent within the DNA, RNA of the human being's genetic framework, and Allah was the benefactor. You get it? Allah was the merciful benefactor. Once we are delivered out of that mother's womb, listen to this carefully. Once we are delivered from the mother's womb and we begin to learn based on our interaction with other things in the environment, that's when the intellect begins to accrue. That's when the intellect begins to develop. That's when the intellect begins to distinguish this from that from the other. So the intellect is a secondary. Hmm? It's a secondary development, while the intelligence is actually the first development 
that we spoke of as being information already encoded within the DNA. Intelligence means internal, I-N, telling or T-E-L-L-I, communication. From where? From the gents or the genes. Internal communication coming from the genes or inherent within the genes. Allah power packed those genes with that information. So Allah is the one who gets the credit. We like to give society credit for, you know, giving me a PhD, a master's degree. That has nothing to do with intelligence. That has everything to do with the development of your intellect. So there's the intelligence that you're born with genetically. Once you're outside of the womb, then your five senses become open to the environment. And that's when you begin to take in external information from the environment. And that is the beginning of your five basic senses journey into the world of intellectual exploration. Wow. Look at what this feels like. Look at that, what that tastes like. Look at what this smells like. Look at what this sounds like. See, all of the five senses become activated once the five senses become open to the environment after you are born. So because your five senses are faulty, see, your intelligence, there's no fault in your intelligence. There's no fault in you going to sleep and waking up and blinking and salivating and doing all of those things that are unconsciously um, activated in you by Allah. No fault in that. Hmm? No fault in your intelligence until the manipulators get to your intelligence and start manipulating your intelligence. We'll talk about that later. But as Allah created your intelligence within your DNA, RNA, I don't know why in the world they want to mess with your mRNA now and give you a fake one, take out the real one and give you a fake one through some injection. I don't understand what that's all about. They are saying that Allah made a mistake. We got the better program for your RNA. You better watch these people. You don't have much longer to listen to common sense like what I'm giving you and what other people are giving you. You don't have much longer on this earth to, to, to reject what we're saying or to pretend like we're not here, warning you. So that's a subject for later, but don't think I'm not gonna cover it, I am. If you don't like that kind of conversation, click. Our job is to not only give good news, but to also be warners. That's all throughout the Quran. That's the job of every prophet and messenger that has come to this earth to be a giver of good news and also a warner to those who can't appreciate the news because there are consequences coming behind your pretending like you're the three monkeys, no see, no hear, you know, no speak. There are consequences to that. So be aware of that. Now, once the five senses become activated, that's when the intellect begins to grow. What does the word intellect mean? It means internal election. That means the things you are electing to do or choosing to do right up in here, inside, internal election. And what is the intellect designed to do? It's designed to look at the choices, most of the time it's just two choices, right, wrong, good, bad, clean, filthy, right? And the intellect has been programmed by Allah to make the better choice. I don't like the way this feels, so I'm not going to stay in that emotional bag. I like feeling happy, joyful. That's how Allah created us. I like feeling pleasure and pleasant, see? So the things that we do that contribute to pleasure and pleasantness, to joy, hmm? Those are the things that we entertain doing and the things that do the opposite in our system that we hate, we don't like it, we know it's not good for us, we reject that. But again, the world of social manipulators have conditioned us to accept those things that our common sense mind tells us is not good for us. First time you picked up that stogie, right? <laughs> But the world taught you to say, that's good. I'm doing all right. I got through my first cigarette. And because whispers are going into the ear, they say, do it again. Do it until you perfect it. Do it until you can blow that, that circle. 
That's what they used to tell us when we were children. Blow a heart. See if you can do it until you can blow a heart in the smoke. <laughs> no. Yeah, they were manipulating us to no end. So we would just stay there and just out of habit keep <coughs> until, until the cough went away. It'll revisit you later in the form of some smoking disease, some cancer or something is going to revisit you. It only stopped warning you because you stopped listening. Hear what I'm saying? Imam Muhammad spoke on this time and time again. He said, there's a voice in the consciousness that warns you when you do wrong, but if you refuse to listen to it, it says, well, hell, he ain't listening to me. I ain't gonna waste the rest of my voice on this dude. I'll let him learn from circumstances. That's when we begin to suffer. Y'all get it? That's when we begin to suffer, okay? So that's the difference between the intelligence, yes, which sir. is all of the merciful gifts. Thank you, Sayyid. That's all of the merciful gifts that have been deposited into your genetic framework. That's Ar-Rahman. And he gives that freely to all. Jesse James, Adolf Hitler, Mother Teresa, Pope John Paul II, uh, you, me, Benjamin Bilal, Imam W.D. Muhammad, everybody that Allah allows to touch base on this planet Earth gets a Rahman. It's like saying because you're evil, when you go outside and the sun is shining, it's going to stop shining because you and your evil self came outside. No, it's not. It's going to shine just as bright because that's a part of Allah's merciful benefactor. Nature gives to all. But when it gets to Ar Rahim, when Allah begins to choose who to redeem, see, redemption is a result of you coming out here and making the wrong choices, the intellect, internal election. When you begin to elect the wrong thing, then Allah has to come save you. That's after you get out of the womb. He doesn't have to put that into play while you're in the womb. All of his merciful benefits as a benefactor is already being clocked into your nature. But once you're born and you have the benefit of the experiences that your five senses are going to open you up to, then you have to begin to really pay more meticulous attention to the choices that you make. And if you keep your heart right and you make a mistake, then Allah will come and send his Rahim to rescue you. But it's only for the good people that he will do that. The good, the bad people had their chance in the Rahman stage. <laughs> when Allah said, mercy for all. But the bad people who make the bad choices consciously and they do bad things against good people with choice, then Allah says, well, okay, you think you're getting away with something, but you're not really getting away with anything. And I'm going to send some punishment your way just to wake you up. And that's a part of the warning that we were talking about earlier. So I hope that's understood. That's my short introduction to today's information. Let me bring up my notes. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, as we continue. This world of social manipulators have always been heavily invested in the establishment of coded language. Repeating, this world of what I call social manipulators have always been heavily invested in the establishment of what we're calling coded language. Their codes are intended to make masses of people languished, which means weak, as well as anguished, which means tormented. And you'll notice the closeness of sound between the words languish and anguish to the word language, because that's a part of the social manipulator's linguistic play on words. 
Now on September 11th, 2001, the manipulators pulled off one of the greatest hoaxes ever known in history. And that was the imploding, not the exploding, the imploding of the World Trade Buildings in New York Buildings, number one, number two, and the oft forgotten building number five. The Twin Towers were deeply symbolic of messages that were originally instituted in the Bible as the Towers of Joachim and Boaz. Joachim and Boaz. The Towers of any scripture, wherever you see towers mentioned in any scripture or even any myth, those towers are symbolic of the human being's brain's right and left hemispheres, which control the syncretical, meaning how we see things as one thing and how we see all things as being interrelated. That's one side of the brain. That's the right side of the brain, syncretism, synthesizing information. But the brain also has a left side, which science and psychology considers to be analytical. It likes to break things down into sections. So the right side likes to keep things whole, keep things synchronized. But the left brain, they say, and it's not really all this simple, but we're simplifying it just so that we'll understand it, at least the beginnings of it until we study it more deeply. The left side is dealing with the analytical the more scientific and analytical aspects of learning. In the middle of these, middle of these two hemispheres we're talking about is the so-called third eye. Hmm? Now, if you look here at the picture of these two pillars, which as I'm saying, represents the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain. In the middle, you'll see stairs, stairs, and you see light emanating from the top of the stairs. This is symbolic of the activation of what is called your pineal gland. The pineal gland, they call it the single eye. It's called that in the Bible, where Jesus says, if your eye be single, the body will be filled with light. So you might say, well, we're Muslims here. We don't follow the Bible, mister. Then let me go to the Quran. The Quran speaks about a single eye also. It's called the single eye of certainty. It's called in the Quran. You have to find that for yourself. I don't do homework for people. I only put you on the road. I don't hand walk you all the way to your goal or to your destiny. But it's called Ainul Yaqeen. I've spoken on it many times throughout the course of this course. The single eye of Yaqeen, El Yaqeen, means the certainty, meaning there's no doubt in this eye. There's doubt in these eyes. <laughs> you know, when they say, my eyes must be playing tricks on me. See, the third eye doesn't play tricks on you. But if the third eye is not open, so that the nature in which Allah created that third eye's vision to be able to capture images and interpret images and give you back the correct interpretation of images and what you're seeing on the higher level. See, if it's not open to that degree, then you don't have the single eye of certainty. You have these speculative eyes, these guesswork eyes. So all of this symbolism, as you can see, this is attached to the history of Freemasonry. They've taken that symbolism which is really just the symbolic references related to how the body operates. It's not this spooky stuff that they've been trying to sell you in the Masonic Lodge and the Shriners meetings and all of that, trying to make you believe you got some spooky otherworldly kind of connection to knowledge. No, they've taken every single one of these symbols from their study of the human body itself, especially the human brain. And the Bible came to explain it to people in cryptic language because they had to hide just the fact that they had that knowledge because the maintainers of the society 
in those olden times especially, did not want common people with this level of insight into knowledge. And it's the same thing for today. That's why they keep us stupid and dumbed down with all of this foolishness that they're feeding us through mass media, especially. And I don't think I've ever witnessed a society of more dumbed down people than I'm finding <laughs> when I examine what has happened in the last two to three years in the world, but particularly here in America. I, don't, I, I never thought people would be able to be this dumbed down, but Imam Muhammad warned us about it in the 1980s, the 1980s, he made a statement. And those of you who are of other ethnic groups don't feel offended at this. He wasn't talking so-called racism or ethnic superiority stuff when he said this. He said that there's a growing trend taking place amongst so-called white people in leadership where they are losing their sense. They are losing the ability to judge situations intellectually. I'm paraphrasing, but that's exactly what he was saying. He said that about so-called white people in leadership positions. He wasn't talking about the whole ethnic group or all of Europe and America. He was talking about people who were presently at that time occupying leadership positions because the way in which they got those leadership positions, it wasn't the correct way. We talk about the democratic way and it wasn't the democratic way. It, there was all kinds of secret handshakes and big money being passed around and bloodline relationships with people. And you come to find out even President Obama had blood relationships with previous white presidents. Uh, how do you figure that? Yeah, so he's just a boy out of Chicago? So you thought? No, these people are chosen for these positions is what you need to understand. And uh, what I'm saying to you now Behind what Imam Muhammad said about the dumbing down of this leadership group, <laughs> I'm saying to you that for them, the jig is up because this cosmic seasons have changed. We'll talk about that in a moment. So understand these towers are indicative of the right and left hemispheres of the human brain. And that middle portion that leads up to potential enlightenment is the third eye, which leads up to the pineal gland and its activation. It's responsible for elevating one into pineal gland illumination. The third eye is the sixth chakra, as it's called in India and some other places. And the pineal gland represents the seventh chakra. So when you read about these numbers, such as six and seven, especially seven, seven heavens and so forth and so on, and you read about it, uh, um, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, you think it's talking about some fantasy children's story, and it's not. These are people who are going deep, deep, deep down the rabbit hole of symbolic interpretation of things. They want the common people to remain dumb to these things but they want their leadership and the children and the children's children of that leadership to remain totally enlightened to their schemes so that they can continue hmm, to practice those schemes above the head of the unknowing masses of people. And again, I repeat, the jig is up and the seasons are changing to the point now where many, many of the common people are coming into their own pineal gland activation, if you will. They're coming into ideas that were held back from them just a few years ago, information you could never have accessed, even in the time Imam Muhammad was with us. Since then, what this one invention called the internet has brought to the masses of people in this world has been phenomenal. Both the good information and the negative information, they all exist within the parameters of the so-called internet. So it depends on your disposition towards the information that's going to determine whether you become one of the enlightened ones or one of the eliminated ones. Imam Muhammad said that it was coming a period that he called the great elimination of the human soul. That sounds very serious, doesn't it? 
it's interesting to me that I personally, I haven't heard of any of Imam Muhammad's imams speaking on that subject. I'm not saying they haven't. I haven't been everywhere at all times to hear everything. I'm just saying that it should be more prominent in their Juma and Dalim lectures. The great elimination of the human soul. And I think that the main reason why they're not speaking on it is because, unfortunately, they don't really know what the human soul is. With the Quran in their hands, they have no clue what the human soul is. If I asked uh, many of them, what is the word in the Quran for the soul? Some of them, good number of them wouldn't even be able to tell me that. And if they could tell me that, it's gonna be on a very superficial level. Oh, that's the word nafs, N-A-F-S. Okay, what does nafs mean? How was it used in the Quran? Is it an internal thing or is it an external thing? What is the nafs? That right there is where they're going to begin to stutter. And I'm not saying this to make fun of our imams. I'm saying this hoping that they will hear it and say, well, if this guy does know, let's say, what the nefs is and how to break it down and what Imam Muhammad did mean by the elimination of the nefs or the elimination of the soul, that sounds so serious that I need to take a chance and call this brother and just ask him, just test him, see if he knows what he's talking about. But you don't have to call me. You don't have to email me because about five videos on my email channel with the name soul in them and they will explain to you more than what it is you'd probably want to know or even think to ask so just go to imam benjamin bilal on youtube and hit the play button and remember to subscribe below that's all you have to do and I not only tell you what the word nafs means as the soul, I also tell you what the word ruh means, which they also translate as the soul. So how do we know in English which word is which if they're using the same English word to describe both Arabic words? Nafs, soul. Ruh, sometimes spirit, but then they say soul. Of the soul, we know very little. That says ruh. So how do we know the difference? You have to know the difference by knowing the nuances of both the Arabic terms as well as the English word soul and what it and they are connected to. That's my job. I'm a master linguist. I'm not your economist. Don't come to me trying to learn how to make more money. Imams out there got the lock on that. They can show you that all day long. Some of them are doing very well making the money. So go to them and ask them to give you a crash course on how to make more money. That ain't what I do. I can show you the technique, the spiritual technique for bringing more to you. We're going to see a video on that in just a moment by Dr. Bruce Lipton. Yeah, there's a law of attraction that if you learn how to master that, you'd get just about anything of good that you want. And Allah tells you that in the Quran. But that's not what this is. This is to increase the level of acumen in each one of you as individuals when it comes to understanding words. Imam Muhammad said words make people. He didn't say money makes people. You know, they got that phrase, money makes the man. No, that's not what Imam Muhammad was talking. He said words make people. So if words make people, then if you rearrange and reassess and give different value to words, then you're going to rearrange and reassess and give different value to people, starting with yourself, starting with yourself. Now, most English words that contain double L's, such as the word illuminate, intelligent, illustrious, the word all, and even the word ill which does damage to whatever those two L's are representing. Those two L's in all of these words represent the idea, the same idea that you find in those Twin Towers, believe it or not. The destruction of the Twin Towers signaled the advent of the purposeful attack on the human brain itself. Listen carefully. I think I need to repeat that sentence. The destruction on September 11 of the Twin Towers signaled the 
advent of the purposeful attack on the human brain itself. The social conspirators, they speak through contrived events that they let loose into the public as though it's happenstance or as though nature did it. <laughs> this so-called coronavirus, this so-called COVID-19 thing. They, you think God did this. God unleashed this as a punishment on us sinners. And if Muslims are thinking like that, you're out of your mind. Because what it means is that you're thinking on the level that most Christians were taught. And that is, is that the human being is born so sinful that God has to come and put you back into goodness. And the only power that whips you back into goodness, according to scripture, is Satan. It's never Allah who, in fact, Allah says in the Quran that it's not even really him that's punishing you. You're punishing yourself. So, you know, he's not whipping you. He'll leave you on your own. You'll bump your head until you make it back home. But Allah is not this fierce power that's out there waiting to whip you and destroy you and bring you down and put blotches all over your body like Job. That's not what Allah does. So stop letting these social and spiritual manipulators among us cause us to believe that all of these bad things that are happening in the world is because God is about to wrap it all up and judge it and send the majority of people on this earth to hell. You think that's the purpose of Allah? That's what he has going on around <laughs> in his so-called mentation. Yes, is what he's thinking about all the time. Let me hurry up and just conclude this, these bombs. He's, he's indicting himself. Yeah, God that you call God is indicting himself by saying that the majority of human beings are just no good, worthless criminals. And I'm going to send all of them to hell, except for these few here. You know, my uh, chosen ones, uh, Jews, uh, who, you know, whoever you think the chosen ones are, you know, the Jews think it's themselves, you know, we're God's chosen, the rest of the world is going to wherever bad people go. And then you got the Christians in different pockets of Christianity believing the same thing. If you have not confessed to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you ain't going to make it into heaven. So you can forget. Then you got Muslims because they're following the rationale of the people who came before them. They're not following the rationale, the reasoning of what Allah put in his Quran. Because if they were, they would understand that it's not your Muslimness that's going to get you into Jannah. It's not your shahadatain that's going to help you attain Jannah or paradise. You'd know that if you were reading and depending on the detailed explanation of these subjects that are given to you by Allah in the Quran itself, not in these exterior external sources. I'm talking about within the Quran itself is the support for you understanding that your declaration from your mouth has nothing to do with where your life ends up in this life and in the life to come. It depends on your conscious acts and your conscious determination to do good or if you consciously determine to do other than good then you have to pay the price for that but it has nothing to do with your flesh being sinful just because you're born a human or born from in africa or in india you and you don't you haven't taken shahada or you whatever and now you think that's worthy of hellfire you're out of your cotton picking mind and you should be out picking cotton Those people had a better chance of heaven than most of us do. So you have to understand the nature of this symbolism. It's talking about the human being and how humans operate mechanically, psychologically, emotionally, and in all of the other very subtle levels of our growth and development. So that attack was on the human brain. And it was from this point, meaning the point of September 11th, 2001, until now that moral and rational thinking was decisively assaulted. Now you can do your own cursory study of what has happened in the world since September 11th, since that event. And you're going to see that influences have been unleashed into world society that were 
particularly directed towards the diminishing and the dumbing down of the ability to make cogent and intelligent decisions. You'll see it for yourself. Just check the, the, the headlines of most major newspapers around the country and you'll see it very clearly. It, it, look, what used to be the, what was that, the National Enquirer, you remember that? magazine i think it's still out and we used to always look at them as oh they're the ones with the conspiracy theories they're the ones with these crazy scientific pseudo-scientific ideas and you know the man with two heads and all that was the national Enquirer. that's what they called news but since september 11th if you study the nature of the news that has come out on your major newspapers front pages new york times that way i'm from new york daily new york post daily news now the average headline for the traditional newspapers are showing information that National Enquirer used to be famous for. <laughs> Some sex pervert did something, or, you know, whatever, you know, people beheading, they like for that to be on the front page. Woman beheaded in front of her children, they love for that to be on the front page with no solutions as to how to <laughs> control or eliminate that behavior. Because again, it's an assault on the human brain and its moral and rational capacity. That was a theme of Imam Waratuddin Muhammad. He spoke for many decades, all three of those decades that he was leader. He spoke on the moral and rational capacity, see? That's your twin towers, believe it or not. Within you as a human being, your twin towers are called moral and rational logic. Let me prove it before moving on from Imam Muhammad's language. Imam Muhammad said that the legs, the legs of the human being the two legs of the human being are indicative of moral and rational logic. Can you see in the word logic, the letters L-O-G? The L-O-G in logic is the same as the L-E-G in leg because logic is what moves you forward. You get it? Logic is what is responsible for your ability to move your life in a forward moving direction, just like your legs take your body forward. Your legs are not responsible for moonwalking. I don't care what Michael Jackson told you. Your legs have been designed by the source creator and designer to take your body forward. And that's what moral and rational logic has been designed to do in the brain, to take your life, to make an assessment of where you are in space and time and what it's going to take rationally to move you forward. What impediments do I have to move out of the way, et cetera, in order to make it to my next goal and then my next goal and then my final goal, which is my human purpose to make it to Jannah. It's the moral and rational legs of logic. Imam Muhammad taught this for many years. So those are the two towers. Those are the two legs. It's your legs that allow you to stand up and tower over those people and those things that are beneath you. Well, that's what your logic does. Now, if there's an assault on your moral and rational logic, then you should be seeing the same results as the assault on the Twin Towers. So just study what happened post 911. And you'll see what's happening on the minute or the micro level when it comes to how human life is being assaulted by the manipulators. Let's continue. The numbers 911 have always meant emergency. 911, call 911. Why there's an emergency? When you call 911, that's how they answer the phone. Where's the emergency? Now, if you say that your cat got stuck in the fence, they ain't coming out for that. It's in the fire department. <laughs> but if you say, you know, there's somebody in my window with a knife or a pistol, now they want to get over there right away because it's an emergency. 
Now, the language conspirators, they got this from the Bible's numerology concerning Jesus being crucified in the ninth hour and dying in the 11th hour. Christians who read the New Testament, they know this very well. Although they might not being attention, uh, be, be, they might not be paying attention to the numbers. But the Bible says that Jesus was put up on the cross. And the Bible makes it plain that it was in the ninth hour. And that he gave up the ghost. Hmm? It says he gave up the ghost and his head dropped. And right before it dropped, he said something. He said, it is done. It is finished. <laughs> Finito. Then he, his head dropped. That's how they say they knew that he had died because his head dropped. All of that is symbolism. We're going to investigate that just for a minute before getting into our main subject in our couple of videos that you need to stay awake and pay attention to. Like I said, my classes are not for entertainment. Don't come here for entertainment. Don't come here for a short spurt of happiness and joy and, oh, I learned something new in the instructor's class. No, come here. This is life-saving information. And I think most of you who have been coming here for a minute or more, you know that now. So we're talking about 911 as an emergency number that the conspirators learned from what was put into the Bible concerning the crucifixion of Jesus, being crucified in the ninth hour and dying in the 11th hour. That's how 911 became an emergency number all across the planet. What killed Jesus? Now, remember, we're talking about the Bible story, not the Quran narrative, the Bible story. The Quran says all of it is guesswork. <laughs> it said none of it happened. What killed Jesus? It was the cup of vinegar. I want you niggers to listen to me. It was the cup of vinegar and the herb known as hyssop, H-Y-S-S-O-P. Listen carefully. Those are the two things that the Bible says were responsible for the death of Jesus on the cross. In Latin, the word vinegar is called asita. I'm getting a little bit further into Imam Muhammad's translations and interpretations now. In Latin, vinegar is called asita, A-C-E-T-A. -E and the word asita is a play on the word ascetic and asceticism. Asceticism is what we refer to when we speak about the monks and the people who leave the social order and go up into the mountains to pray and to meditate and to read and to contemplate. And they really don't want a whole lot to do with people to be people, people to people kinds of uh, interaction. So they separate themselves from the social life in order to live a more spiritual existence in the higher up regions of the county, the country, this even you know, they get out of the city some, when they can, and they go into the mountains and that kind of thing. Those are called ascetics. Asceticism is the separating of the social person, which Allah created all of us to be. Separating that social person from the world of fellow social beings. The challenge for human beings is in the social nature and interaction of beings. That's when you're going to be tested, when you have to deal with other people outside of your little clan, your little tribe, your little village, and you begin to spread out as Allah created us to do. And you meet new people who look different, speak different languages, eat different kinds of food, dress in different kinds of clothes. And all of this is, has, it has you scratching your head. But Allah says in the Quran that he created us as tribes and nations so that we might acknowledge each other. Lita ara fool, huh? so that we might know each other, acknowledge each other for those very differences. 
not that we, as a translator adds, not that we should despise each other. It's not why we're in different skin tones and colors and hair textures and eye colors. Allah didn't do all of that to make you say that blue-eyed, blonde-haired white man is the devil. See, Allah didn't do that differentiation in color and uh, height and all of that. And uh, you got the Mau Mau and the Tutus and different parts of Africa. You got the, he didn't create one short and the other one Watusi tall and just so you can say the the tall one is better than the short that's not why Allah did all of that that's your human brain going cuckoo that's making those assessments Allah did it because variety is the spice of life and he wanted you to concentrate on a superior context that supersedes the physical and that is what's happening on the invisible level of human activity taking place in the heart region as your sensitivities and your sentiments and taking place in the brain region as your intellect, hmm? your sensibilities, your sensitivities and your sensibilities. And the killing of Abel by his brother Cain in the Bible, Imam Muhammad said, is the killing off of the Abel it in you, the ability. Ask the able that was killed, human ability. Imam Muhammad actually said that there's a war on human ability, able. The tiller of the uh, livestock, he was the one in charge of taking care of living beings, mammals. That was Abel's job. His brother came, was charged with taking care of the ground the vegetation. And he got jealous because God gave the favor to Abel. But Abel was in charge of mammalian life, emotional life. The animals are all emotional. The reptiles are not emotional. The animals, the mammals, being born out of their mother's sack and being held close to their mother's breast for feeding and for comfort and warmth and all of that, th those are the ones that Abel was in charge of. And you'd be surprised at the connections and the consonants between Abel, A-B-E-L, and the word Bilal, B-I-L-A-L. -L. And Bilal, <laughs> and he attempted to bury him also. <laughs> And he became the caller to human excellence. Isn't that wonderful? See, the Quran is answering the Bible. But if you don't understand the cryptic messages, you won't understand the cryptic meanings. And the cryptic meanings and the messages are actually for those people who have delved deeply into that level of investigation. It's not necessarily for common people who don't think about these things. Leaders on high, they think about these things all of the time, and they spend their time combing through the Quran, combing through the Bible, so that they can develop another scheme. The Bible allowed them into multiple and multi-tiered schemes. The Quran came and closed the book on those schemes. So you can't go into the Quran looking for a scheme against humanity unless you learn how to manipulate the meanings of words. They can't change the words of the Quran, but they sure enough could change the meanings of words so that what you think means this actually means that. And that's what Nunetics is in the present day process of busting upside the head those artificial meanings, those contrived meanings. Calling a mu'min a believer, that kind of stuff. Calling salat a ritual prayer done five times per day, just as a ritual, just as physical exercise for about five to seven minutes per prayer. That's the kind of changing of the guard when it comes to meanings that I'm referring to now. Thinking that a Muslim is a shahadatain person. Thinking that an imam is a person who stands before you on Juma Friday prayer and teaches you some things and then leads you in the physical ritual called the salat. 
Well, that's not what an imam is in the Quran. In fact, the Quran says that the Quran itself is an imam. <laughs> and it says Ibrahim is an imam of the Alameen. Figure that one out. Imam Muhammad translated al Alameen as the systems of knowledge. So if the Quran says that Ibrahim was invited by Allah to become the Imam of al Alameen, then what in the world is an Imam over all systems of knowledge? If we accept Imam Muhammad's language as the go-to language for that phrase. Imam Muhammad said, Prophet Muhammad is the leader of the modern world. If he's the leader of the modern world, that means he's still here. So why are you looking 1,500 years ago at an Arab in the middle of the desert? You're looking at the prototype. <laughs> You're still worshiping the template. <laughs> when the template is only there so that you'll get the right in the specific uh, dimensions for what Allah is creating, not in history, in you right now, there's a Muhammad the prophet, and he's the leader of the modern world. If you would just let him do his thing, thing, <laughs> it says that he is the one responsible for liberating the human essence. He's the great liberator, according to the Quran. And if he's still here, and if he, as Allah says in the Quran, is rahmatul lil alamin and rahmatul lil nas, hmm? that he is also the mercy giver. Hmm? Over al alamin all systems of knowledge. That means that every piece of knowledge you touch, and I'm talking now specifically to you imams, you muftis, you sheikhs and sheikhers, every piece of knowledge that you investigate, you're supposed to be attempting to infuse that knowledge with Allah's mercy, because it's the mercy that leads to the opening up of the sciences. According to the Quran, Allah says he created everything upon the principle of rahma and ilm. Mercy first, and then science or knowledge. So if the Greeks have paganism and idol worship in their logic, what did the Muslims of old do? They went into the Greek logic and they kept that which was useful and they discarded and taught the Greeks better. They discarded some of it, and then they said, I'm going to show you the better way of viewing this same thing that you were looking at. And that's how the whole continent, practically, of Europe came into that period that they call the Enlightenment. Hmm? The Enlightenment, not just in the arts and the science, but not just in the arts, but also in the sciences. Because the Quran became the great interpreter of logic for all people. And the Quran was intended for that, not just for a separated group of people calling themselves Muslim speaking Arabic that nobody else understands. And not even them, they don't even understand it. <laughs> not just those people, but for the entire world of Anas, the humanity itself. Yes, it's beautiful when you understand it. Let's continue. Now, <clears throat> What killed Jesus? Vinegar called acita and hyssop, which is an herb that lowers blood pressure. And blood is a symbol of social life. Another nugget from the treasures of language and logic taught by Imam Warathuddin Muhammad. Blood represents social logic. Social means how we get along socially. And based on how people get along socially, we want to congregate with each other, especially if we start learning that we have things in alike with each other, like the food we like and the clothing we like and the music we like. Normally people who have those things in common like to live together and they develop a particular level of soul quality hmm? related to the nafs, soul quality that Imam Muhammad called the development of the group soul. Every ethnic group has that interest. The Italians have their group soul. The Latinos, 
different people from different parts of Africa and different other parts of Asia and India. And so they all have their particular group souls that keep them bonded with each other and relating to each other and wanting to marry, intermarry and have children amongst each other. It's their group soul that has that interest. But Allah has created an overriding and overarching soul called the human soul itself. And the world had to evolve up to that point. And we're just about there now where the concerns for life is a concern for human life, wherever you find that life, not just my individual ethnic group's concerns. This is a beautiful development if you understand it. And that's why the conspirators can't do nothing with what we're talking about now. There was a time when I would have been picked off <laughs> by a long range rifle <laughs> for teaching some of what I'm teaching. But it can't happen. As Imam Muhammad says, too late, Nicodemus. You've killed your last one. <laughs> this is our day. Understand that. So, blood a symbol of social life. Where did they get that word blood? See, once you understand the multiple connections between the English language and the Arabic language, and the European got that interest once the Quran was introduced into the equation during the Renaissance. It created the Renaissance, the European Renaissance. The Quran created that. On the most part, it created that. They hid that from you in history books, but that's the truth. That's a fact. So they looked at these words and they applied the same logic that we are applying when we talk about consonantal connections. They started comparing the consonants and they developed a slew of scientifically related words in English that they got from scientifically established words in the Quran and highly evolved the social connections that were given in the Quran. So what's the word for social life? What's the word for the protection that the social groups are given as a community of people? What is that word in the Quran? The word is balad. Listen carefully. The word in the Quran is balad. And this city, this town made safe. Allah says in Surah Atin. Watini was a tune, watur is sinin. And this town, no, this city made secure, safe. Because Balad represents a city that has a fortified wall surrounding it. So any Joe or Jane can't just creep up in there and see what's cooking. <laughs> they have to have special permission to enter Balad. Well, guess what? Within your body, outsiders to that system have to have special permission to enter your blood. Did you know that? You see how these things correspond when you understand consonantal connections? So they got the word blood from the study of the Arabic word balad. And I can show you connection after connection after connection in the logic of the science related to your blood and related to what the Quran says about balad. And it calls it balad of al amin the city of security. What does that mean? It gave, again, the scientific European world the word immune. So where is immunity found, my friends? In the blood. Belledil amin means the blood containing immunity. That's its fortification. It's a symbol of social life. So in the human being's social life, there is also a level of immunity. What is the immunity for our social engagement? When we get together at the masjid as Muslims, when the Jews get together at the synagogue as Jews, when the Christians get together in the church and the temples for the other people of the world, the Buddhists and others, they get together in their social groups. What is their protection? It's what the Quran calls Iman, 
Hmm? I am a a n iman. What is that from? It's from the verb amana. What did the English speaking world get from the word amana? They got the word immune. Same exact consonants. The a, the m, and the n. Immune. I know it's an I, but you can transfigure that just like in Arabic. It's Iman, I am it, but it's from Amana, A M N. And it is also speaking to ancient Egyptian wisdom that called one of their gods Amun Ra. You'd be surprised at what the Quran is speaking to as ancient wisdom, and Allah is actually making corrections on the logic. See, this is what the early Muslims understood, and it put those early Muslims on top of the scientific community all around the world that were introduced to Quranic logic. So they knew that they couldn't change the wording of the Quran. That's when they went into double time changing the meanings, and they did it through the ancient Persians who had a lookalike language. <laughs> called Farsi and Urdu. It looks like, sounds like Arabic. They began to use those meanings from those languages and they superseded the meanings that were fitra-based, nature-based, that came along with the Quran. Deen al-Fitra, not Deen al-Persia, Deen al-Fitra. So they overlaid Quranic words with ancient Persian meanings and connotations. So that high sop we're talking about that killed Jesus, according to the Bible, is a strategy for lowering social pressure. Blood represents the social life. High sop lowers social pressure, which means that this idea was designed to lower social protest amongst the masses of people. You see how not a lot of people fought out against this whole COVID idea? People just willy-nilly accepted it without doing their own independent investigation. And I'm talking now, especially to Muslims, especially Muslim Americans, they didn't do any independent investigation to find out whether Fauci or Rauchi or Couchy, whatever his name is now, he may have to change it soon, he's on the run. They didn't do any in investigation, not even to his personal history. Isn't that something? Now, if it was you or me, they would have been all through like they were in Trump's house. They've been all in your wife's bedroom trying to find evidence against you. <laughs> if it was you or me, a oh, Negro, he's saying that we should shut down the world. Bill Gates, nobody ever said, let me just go back to his daddy and see what he was into before I accept what this man is saying, who's not a scientist, He's a computer guy. He invents computers and he couldn't get the virus out of his own Apple computer. What in the hell makes me think that he's going to get the virus out of humanity? He said everybody on planet Earth should be vaccinated. And he said it with a very slick smirk on his face. Go back and look, it's on YouTube. He said back in, I think, 2013, that the world was going to be visited by a coronavirus, a, a very strange virus. And he said it like he was in the laboratory inventing it at that time. Go back and look at it. Don't trust me. Trust your own eyes and ears. So if you think I'm harsh against these people, Bill Gates' daddy was one of the co-founders of Planned Parenthood that is the number one advocate of full-term abortions for women. And they're boldly now calling for ninth month abort, full-term abortion. What kind of foolishness is that? And you dumb women out there, ah, that's the women's freedom. That's the freedom for us, finally. What? You don't take the time to find out what freedom means in the Quran, you Muslim women, or you Bible women. You don't take time to find out what freedom means in biblical logic. And you're going to need the Quran for that one, because if you go to the Bible, you will be. The Bible is the main reason why they're abusing women now because of the misrepresentation of the first woman presented, and that is Eve as being the mother of all things, Eve, ill or evil. So you can't really depend on the Bible because most of their female figures, Delilah, uh, you know, Jezebel, the whole, you know, the, most of the women in the Bible, unfortunately, are presented in a, in a very dark 
and distasteful light. It's not even light, it's just darkness. So you can't depend on that. You have to go to what the Quran says about women. Oh, but the Quran says we can beat women. That's that foolishness that I told you was overlaid on top of the fitra meanings of the Quran. You want to know what the fitra meaning of beating the women is? <laughs> you got to get my book called Beating the Women. Is that really in the Quran? Now, I'll give you my email address. Email me. I'll give you a little price and it'll be in the mail tomorrow. But if you don't know what these things mean symbolically, you're going to be under that foolishness for the rest of your life and the rest of the lives of your children and your children's children, thinking that the man has a right from God to slap and correct and to kick and to push and to yell at and all of that, that Allah gave him that right. And that's not the truth. Allah calls the male in the Quran, Arijal. That means the men. But as Imam Muhammad explained to us, Rajal is the name for the feet, the legs, walking, for foot soldiers in the army, anything to deal with the legs and the feet attached to each other in a way which allows the body to make progress forward. That's rajal. And the word for male comes from that word rijal because it's usually the male gender that is free enough in society to make those kinds of advancements. If the woman is home and she's pregnant, she's raising young children, she doesn't have the same social freedom that the male has. So his obligation, based on nature, became the one who would be out in the society looking for the scraps and looking for the food and the opportunities and the job and all of that. He was free to roam with his legs and feet. He was free to roam in order to make that happen. The male is called a papa. All right, we call him Papa. That's from the ancient people's pronunciation of Paw, Paw, P A W, P A W, because the little children would see their fathers go out hunting. And when the fathers would come back, before the children could identify their individual fathers, because they were too far away to see the faces, they were wearing the kilts at that time in parts of the world, the Irish and other people. And they used to see them walking back, but they could see legs coming their way. So they said, pa, pa, meaning leg, leg. Because the male has always been identified as the legs that we stand on in order to make advancements forward. But it wasn't just talking about physical males. It was talking about what we mentioned earlier as the two legs of moral and rational logic. So when Allah says, that the men are the maintainers over the woman, it didn't say of the women, it said over the women. That means women are here and males, men are here. Now that adds to the complaint, doesn't it? Oh, you're saying that God is saying that the men are over the women? Yes, that's exactly what it's saying, but it's not talking about the male per se. It's talking about the ability in men and women to utilize moral and rational logic. And that moral and rational logic is the protector over what? The emotionality. Yeah. It's your moral and rational thinking that has jurisdiction and authority over emotional decisions that you don't have clear insight into. And that's what that means as one of its many, many interrelated meanings. The Quran is wisdom. It's not academic information. It's wisdom. So uh, female. You have Arijal in you. It's called your moral and rational logic, the way your brain reasons. See, males and females have that moral and rational logic. 
Males and females have anisa in them, meaning a level of decision-making that is related mostly to emotions. And if those emotions get uh, corrupted, then the male has to put the female back in check. That's what beating the women means in the Quran, that your moral and rational mind has to go to work in order to subdue that wayward emotionality when it becomes outrageous. <laughs> I teach a whole course on this, but all of it is in my book called Beating the Women. Is that really in the Quran? Let's move on. Once human beings become separated from their social consciousness and responsibility, the manipulators can then work their schemes against the masses weaknesses. See, it's only at the point where we become separated in terms of social consciousness. We're so afraid to engage people anymore that we become insulated. Hmm? We, become, we become just a self-interested to the point where we become selfish. And that's what they're waiting for, the point at which you become self-fish because they know how to fish in the waters of your sensitivity. And they'll get you every time with their hooks. But when you swim in a school, <laughs> It's much more difficult to catch the fish. <laughs> so they, they depend on that. You being separated from the bunch, you being socially distanced. I hope you're beginning to understand where I'm going with this. Now, changing gears just for a moment. And I have what I'm about to say in another relatively new book called Deconstructing G-O-D slash Reconstructing A-L-L-A-H. You can email me. I'll send you my book list if you don't have it and you can order to your heart's delight. The word Allah is not a proper name. I mentioned that in the onset of this conversation. The name Allah is actually a title. It is speaking to a neutral aspect of the source creator's method of functioning in the universe. And the universe is also called the cosmos. It is this neutrality. And mind you, the word neutral and neuter is related to the word nature. Nature is neutral. You don't believe it? As good as you think you might be morally speaking, if you jumped off the Empire State Building on purpose and hit the ground, nature will kill you. Nature will be responsible for your death because the nature of gravity falling at that velocity, hitting the concrete or the dirt or whatever you end up on is going to cease and desist your life as a functioning uh, life. Nature did that because you made a crazy decision or a crazy mistake. But nature is not going to say because he's nice, a nice guy, or because he's got wife and children at home or, you know, whatever, or because she's pregnant and jumped. Yeah, let's save that one. Every now and then some type of uh, out of the way thing happens that you say, oh, the mercy of God. OK, I can understand that. But on the most part, the law of nature says. We're neutral. <laughs> you have to suffer the consequences of your actions. That's what nature says. Let's see why. Nature, I repeat, is neutral. And that is how Allah created everything in this creation called the universe to operate. It is this neutrality which Allah has clocked into the fabric of the cosmos as his unalterable law. Listen carefully to the sounds of these words, L-A-W. Law. The substratum of this law is called 
al-fitrah in the Quran. And the fitrah is merely referring to the patterns in nature. If you look at this word pattern and pay attention to the consonants, you're going to see these letters jump out at you. P-T-R, everything else is a suffix. P in language interchanges as what is called a labial sound or a lip sound, it interchanges with F. P, you need your lips. F, you need your lips. So they are interchangeable in linguistics all around the world, according to my system of nunetics and also according to what's called Grimm's Law. Okay. Then you have the T in fit ra, and you have the T's in pattern. You have the R in fit ra, and you have the R in pattern. The N is a suffix. So fitra gave birth to the European word pattern, which ended up in the Greek language as pater, ended up in the Latin languages as padre, T interchanges with D. Yeah, padre, the hard one in the family, the one who makes the hard decisions, eh? So fitra and pattern are the same word. And alifitra represents the patterns that can be observed in nature. And Allah warns us not to cause alterations in nature's standardized behaviors either. That's in 3030. Surah 30, ayah 30, which speaks about Allah's fitra. Make no changes, no alterations. Let there be no alterations. Let tabdila in Allah's fitrah, the sunnatullah. The, pardon me, the fitrah of Allah, the fitratullah. Now the English word law is an offshoot of the Arabic word lahu. Repeating. The English word that we've been discussing as a law operating, especially in the universe, is an offshoot of the Arabic word lahu. Balem yakun lahu kufuan ahad. Lahu is the proto root for the Arabic title Allah. That's not a name. It's a title, and it is the proto-root, meaning before they established an actual technical root for a word that became, that became a triconsonantal word or a trilateral word, it was a bilateral proto-root word. Follow this if you can, or study it when you get the replay on YouTube, inshallah, if it goes up on YouTube. The contrived ancient Persian oriented tri, meaning three, trilateral root word that they call Allah. See, Allah has been mistakenly pointed to as the root word for God in the word ilah, la ilaha, illallah. You know it well. And the definitive G O D, which the Quran refers to as Allah. So they're saying that Allah is the root for both Ilah as well as Allah. Not so. Look at the word law in the Dictionary of Etymology online. It is from the Old English lagu. So what do you notice already? That there's a G where the W should be. Hmm? The plural is laga. But look at what they're saying. Combining form is la. La. Just like I said in lahu. What does it mean? Ordinance, rule, prescribed by authority, regulation. You see the reg there? Regal, regular, regal. Regulate, regal is the one who regulates inside of you that your moral and rational decision-making. 
That's what's regulating. That's Arijal in you, the regulator, the authority. Not just a male. If he doesn't qualify as an authority because he's a knucklehead, then you have to dismiss him. And if the woman is a better regulator of the family's affair, then she becomes Arijal and he becomes Anisa because he's overly emotional and can't handle his business. So law has to do with district governed by the same laws. Now, I want you to think about nature as I'm reading. It also means sometimes right or legal privilege, see, legal privilege. From the Old Norse, lagu, which means law, the collective plural of lag, meaning layer, measure, stroke, literally something laid down, that which is fixed or set. And that's what we're talking about when we discuss Allah's fitrah and also another word we're about to learn and that is Allah's sunnah, which Allah says never changes, it is fixed. Let's continue. This title Allah is not a contraction of the definite article al and the word ilah. That's what the scholars will tell us on the most part that the word Allah came as a contraction of the ancient word that the pagan Arabs had for God, small g-o-d. And when you connect the definite article a-l to the beginning of the word that they had for the pagan God, ilah, then it becomes Allah. That's not true. See, we here in the Nunetics class, we're actually making major corrections on major mistakes major blunders that were made by the grammarians for the past uh, i'd say a thousand to twelve hundred years they've been making this mistake in the language so it's not a contracted word what they are referring to and you have to keep in mind people that the word allah was in the arabic lexicon prior to the coming of the quran the ancient pagan Arabs believed in a god, a pagan god, a moon god called Allah, also known as Allah. Look at this now. When the Quran was revealed, it gave a new presentation to the word Allah. And I'll show you how that happened. Just bear with me. That is actually the meaning for the word Allah. Al-Ilah is actually the meaning for the word a lot in some places you'll see a dash here because one of the names of their pagan gods leading pagan gods was lot l-a-t a lot the whatever lot means and uh, she was portrayed she was portrayed as the moon deity among the ancient pagan arabs prior to the coming of the quran and the mission of the illustrious teacher known as Muhammad, another title, not a proper name, not a proper noun, a title for a man known in history as Ahmed, according to the Quran. His title became Muhammad, one who did Hamad. We're not going to talk about that yet, or maybe not even tonight. Allah is in fact a combination of the definite article al and the proto root word that we were discussing earlier, lahu. It's not a combination of al and illa, it's a combination of al and lahu, al lahu, allahu, not al illahu. Plain as day in front of your face, just like your nose. The Quran came to correct the language. Now let's look at what another author says about what's called the biradical origin of Semitic words. Bear with me. Many scholars who have worked on reconstructing proto-Semitic postulated that the original forms of the Semitic roots consisted of three radicals, like we said, a, la, ha, three consonants or three radicals. That's what many scholars who have attempted to reconstruct proto-Semitic, meaning before the Semitic languages were actually officially established, that's proto-Semitic. They postulated that 
the words contained three radicals with the occurrence of the infrequent biradical or two radical and quadra radical, meaning four radical roots needing explanation, needing explanation. Other scholars such as Moscati and Lipinski assert that Semitic roots had both biradical and triradical forms. My hypothesis, and pardon me for leaving out the author of this, but his hypothesis consists of two parts. One, that all the words in the first language spoken by the Semitic peoples consisted of biradicals. Listen to what this man is saying. This is deep. He said all, not some, not most, all the words in the first language spoken by the Semitic people consisted only of biradicals, meaning two consonants. Number two, that the majority of the postulated biradicals entered these Semitic languages after being expanded by the addition of a third radical. I hope you Arabic teachers out there listening and taking note. Those words were originally two consonants and they were expanded by the addition of a third radical. I've been teaching this for the past five years without having read this, I just read this last week. <laughs> but Allah allowed my pineal gland to find that information. Because when you're on a frequency, it attracts like frequencies. I don't even have to search for stuff. I go online and just type in two words and everything I've been looking for plus some shows up on the screen. That's how I'm able to give it to you. And because I give it to you, Allah gives me more. Continuing. With the result, uh, with the resulting triradical having a semantic relation to the original bilateral or biradical. In support of this hypothesis, I developed, I develop a lexicon whose content has both to satisfy the assumed communication needs of an early people and to consist of productive biradical forms that generate triradical reflexes with associated meanings in some or all of the following languages. Akkadian, Biblical Hebrew, which is different than modern Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, Ge'ez, Sabian, Mandaic, Ugaritic, and Syriac. All of those languages are following the rules of this original proto root by radical development in language, which expanded to become trilateral root words. And when you go to take an Arabic course, they begin you with trilateral roots. They pay no attention to proto roots. Now let's go back to the word Allah, trilateral, triconsonantal, so-called root word for God. And they're saying it's also the root word that gave us Allah when you add a definite article AL on the beginning. The word Allah gave us the word Ilah translated as idol and object of worship. This is Lane's lexicon speaking now. Alif, lam, ha, ala, ha, alif, lam, ha, a, l, h. What does it mean? To serve, worship, watch that word right there, or adore, to protect, grant refuge, preserve, save, rescue, liberate, object of worship. That's what they're leading to, i.e., God, that's what they're saying, God. Alif, Lam, Lam, Ha, which are the letters for Allah. They are now very suspiciously and in a very slick way saying that Allah can become Alif, Lam, Lam, Ha, Allah, God, the one true God applied as our proper name denoting the true God, the true God. There are other gods, but this one is the true God, comprising all, not some, all of the excellent divine names. A unity comprising all the essences of existing things. So they're saying that the word Allah is a combination of all of the existing essences of things that were existing or that were in existence. Under Allah, is that true? 
Allah is a combination. He's just a, the greatest God out of all of the subsidiary gods is what they say. That's called pantheism. When you got one big guy, God, who's superseding and overseeing the activities of the smaller gods that he's delegating their responsibilities to. That's what the pagan Arabs were already believing before the coming of the Quran. It was pantheism, not monotheism as we call it now. These definitions are fabricated. I'm talking about the Lane's lexicon definitions that I just read. They are on the most part fabricated. The true meaning for this alif, lam, ha, alaha, and illa is object of worship, which is a part of pagan activity. You think you're worshiping Allah. No, you're serving Allah's purpose. Worship is for idols. It is you we worship. See how they snuck these meanings in as an overlay on top of the fitra based meanings for these words? Abd does not mean worship. Abd means that we're giving this source creator our ultimate allegiance and that allegiance will never be broken. Abd, in a nutshell, means that which is not temporary. If you were in the past few classes, you'd know that. That word Abd, Ein, Ba, Abait, Dal. Let's look at it real quick. Ein, Bait. The letter B is not ba in Arabic. It's from the word bait, and they truncated it and left it that way. In every other Semitic or Afro-Asiatic language, the B, the letter B means house. The word bait in Arabic means house. In Hebrew, it would be Beth. It's the same word, house. Bethlehem, house of bread. Beth Israel, house of Israel. Even in Greek, alpha, beta. Beta means house. So how come in Arabic, it's just the sound of the sheep? <laughs> Don't you let yourself be one of those sheep. It's bait. So it's ein, bait, dal, abd. What does that mean? This A on the beginning of this word is called the A of negation. You'll have to get the replay, stop what I'm saying and write it down. I'm not gonna put all of this back on the page. I've done this in the last month, actually, in almost every one of those classes. I gave you the meaning for this word. That A is called the A privative or the A of negation because it negates or cancels out whatever this word is that's coming after it. Remember now, these languages originated as bi-radical, bi-consonantal, bilateral, two letters. It began as BD and an A was added to lengthen the meaning of the word and also to add nuances to the meaning of the word. This A in multiple languages means the A of negation. It means not. So Abd means not whatever BD means. What is BD? You simply have to look at words that have BD in them, like bed, bad. It can even be T, because T and D are interchangeable. Bet, the word we were discussing for house, bait. And you can go on and on and on. Boat. It doesn't matter what BT word you come up with. It's going to have an underlying theme that I'm going to explain to you right now. What is that underlining theme? It means not temporary. BD means temporary. In all of the words that have BD attached to them, it has to do with something that you engage temporarily. You don't go to bed like it's your grave and you're gonna be there forever until Allah comes, get, comes to get you. No, you go to bed just to get your energies back. 
if your child is bad, your child is not bad forever unless it's the devil spawn. You know? Yeah, you've seen those movies. Uh, Lucifer's child or something. <laughs> then the child could be bad forever. But uh, under normal circumstances, your child is just having a moment. You know, it needs a time out or whatever they call it, right? Because bad is temporary. You can have a bad headache. It's not forever. It's temporary. might feel like it, but it's temporary. If you place a bet at the horse track, you either win or lose, then all bets are off because bets are temporary. When you go to your house to your bait, you don't go there to stay there all day and all night and you never come out. No, no. As a matter of fact, your whole family might end up moving out of it because your stay there was temporary. You go there to rest, to clean up, to eat, to be entertained a little bit, and then you go back out to work. And the same thing with the boat. You don't live on the boat. I don't care if it's a yacht. Nobody wants to live day to day, 24-7 on a boat. The boat is a temporary excursion or a temporary travel mode that you eventually get off of. So if that's true for BD words and BT words, then what does ABD means? It means not temporary. That means that your relationship with Allah, in terms of you being his abd or ibad, means that this relationship between me and my rob is not temporary. It's forever. I'm committing myself <laughs> to my rob. And I hope that explains it. I'm sure it does for the intelligent people out there who love to be thinkers. Let's continue. So these definitions that we're discussing are fabricated and are intended by the linguistic manipulators to throw us off course. First of all, the word Allah has three lambs, meaning three letter L's, not only two, and should rightfully be transliterated as A-L-L-L-A-H. And if you want to elongate that fatha vowel, then you put another A. Allah, that's how it should be. Allah. And if we go all of the way, way correct, when this A-L is put on the beginning of a word, as Imam Muhammad taught one time that I know of in Malcolm Shabazz Masjid in Harlem about 1985. I think there's a video online where he said that proper Arabic pronunciation of this definite article when it is on the beginning of a word is not al, but el, like E-L. So the name Allah should be rightfully pronounced as Allah, Allah. You know how when it comes to the prophet's attribute, we call him El Amin. You never hear people saying El Amin. Well, how come it's El Amin? Because that was the ancient Arabic way of pronouncing that phrase. They'll spell it sometimes A-L, but when they pronounce it, they pronounce it E-L. So when you say Alhamdulillah and you're beginning a sentence, it should rightfully be pronounced Alhamdulillah, even though you're spelling it with an alif or in an English A, it's still pronounced Alhamdulillah. But when it comes in the middle of a sentence or towards the back of a sentence and it begins with that same A, then it's to be pronounced with the open A sound of A, ah, the short A sound. Now, I hope you're learning something if you're an Arabic student. But let me prove my point about the three lambs in the word Allah. See how it automatically makes it different than what the ancient Arabs were saying? They were saying Allah <laughs> with a double lamb. Allah. Allah revealed to Muhammad how every word in the Quran is to be spelled, believe it or not. And Allah revealed the word Allah with a shedda over an L. I'm going to show you graphically what I'm talking about in just a moment. The shedda, which doubles the sound of the consonant, over the second lamb, doubles that lamb. And the first lamb, after the alif in Allah, that second, that first lamb, pardon me, after the alif counts as the first lamb which then totals three lambs in all. Let's look at it graphically in a moment. Now, this proto-root word, lahu, 
that I'm telling you is the true root word for Allah, Allahu. According to the consonants, lahu means towards a window. The lam means to or towards. Alhamdulillah. See that li, that lam? It means that this is going to or towards Allah. Alhamdulillah. Allah. See? Alhamdulillah. Allah. The praise is going in the direction of, it's going towards Allah. How did they get that? meaning for the letter lamb i'm taking my time tonight because i want you to get this the letter lamb is the shepherd's hook the shepherd that shepherds the sheep he had a shepherd's hook that he would construct and when he wanted his sheep to go in a particular direction see to or towards that's li to or towards alhamdulillah the praise goes to or towards allah is what that is saying in the fitrah language not contrived language fitrah language alhamdulillah it started raining furiously as i told you that i see all of these things as ayat instructing signs from allah rain represents revelation cleansing Hmm? So think about that as I continue on these particular points. Now, that proto root, lahu, according to the consonants, lam and ha are the consonants in lahu, lam and ha, L and H, let's break them down. It means towards a window. The lamb means to or towards because it's a shepherd's hook that would point the direction for the sheep to go in that direction. But lamb was used by the shepherd to also pull the sheep out of the direction of danger. That's what the hook end was for. The hook end was there for him to hold it, but also to take the straight end when necessary in his hand and stretch out the hooked end. And when a sheep was going in the wrong direction, he'd hook it around the neck and pull it back into the direction of safety. You see how that goes? So the lamb became a symbol of teaching and learning. See, teaching meaning this is the way to go and learning which direction not to go in by pulling it out of danger's way. That's the letter lamb. Now, when you understand these letters as I'm giving to you in their nunetic forms, do you know the increase in understanding and guidance that you're going to receive from reading each a single sentences in the Quran? You'll stay on Alhamdulillah for three weeks. Won't be no reading the Quran all of the way through for 30 days doing Ramadan. Allah never said do that in the Quran. You'd be wasting your time falling asleep. <laughs> Just trying to read for reading's sake. That's not what Allah says. Do they not yet tadambaru al Quran? Do they not ponder deeply the Quran? Had it been from other than Allah, they would have found in it many discrepancies, many contradictions. So whatever you've been given as guidance that they say is from Allah and his messenger, if it's presenting contradictions like the hadiths do on a regular basis, right in the same volume of Bukhari or Muslim, sometimes you're going to find two hadiths saying the same thing about the same event. Two different people were there to hear it, but they're telling it in two different ways because that's how it hit them. So there's a discrepancy here. One says it happened this way and the prophet used this word. Another one's saying it happened that way and the prophet used the other. So those are discrepancies. What does Allah say? Had the Quran been from other than Allah, meaning these kinds of minds, you would have found in it the same discrepancies that you find in those varying reports. Allah calls the Quran the best of hadiths, ahsanul hadith. And then Allah says, and then what hadith will they believe in after this? How would you all of you hadith toters? How would you how would you view that when Allah says that the Quran is the best hadith? But you you still want the lesser hadith from men 
The Quran is hadith from Allah, it's revelation. Those reports from the hadith are not revelation. They weren't revealed from on high. They were reported over a period of 250 years from ear to ear to ear and from generation to generation. How can you depend on that? I'm not saying there are not some beautiful sayings and reports that they attribute to Muhammad, but there's no way in the world that you can say for show for show that those are the direct words and um, meanings of words that came directly from Muhammad. We're going to prove it a little bit more in a moment. I'm doing surgery here, so don't, don't interrupt me. Now, <clears throat> lahu, towards a window. Ha, that letter ha, means window. The abstract meaning for it is opportunity. Like we call a window, a window of opportunity. So lahu means anything that takes you in the direction of opportunity. Now, do you see why that is the proto-correct, proto-root letters for Allah? Because Allah is always taking you in the direction of opportunity. And when he puts the definite article on it, Allahu, see, not just Lahu now, Allahu, the definitive director towards grand opportunities. And the English smart people got the English word allow, A-L-L-O-W, from the Quranic word Allah. Allow, meaning to give permission to, from Allah, the ultimate permission giver. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, with the permission of Allah, with the signature of Allah the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. I know you're getting this now. You're getting it as I'm getting it. So it is the ancient Afro-Asiatic languages way. And if you don't know what ancient Afro-Asiatic means, it means ancient Semitic. Don't let Semitic make you think it's talking about Jews only or the Hebrew language only. The Hebrew language is but a small piece of the pie in an overarching umbrella group of languages called Afro-Asiatic. And just the name should tell you what part of the world it came out of. These languages were, were heavily uh, situated in many parts of Africa and Asia. Not just the so-called Middle East it made its way into that region of the world. But it began, for instance, the Bantu language is a part of this Asiatic, Afro-Asiatic expression of languages, the Bantu, African Bantu. Hebrew is a part of the Bantu language group. Same language, same letters, same uh, words, sounds, many of the same sounds in the Bantu language. So you black folk, I don't want to learn no Quran, man. I'm just following the Arabs. You don't even know what an Arab is. You don't know what Arab is and Arabic and Arabia. You don't know what these words mean. So stop telling me what you don't want to be when you don't even know what it is that you're saying you don't want to be. Could be something that you used to be and forgot about or it was taken from you. It might be your inheritance that you're dismissing. So it is the ancient Afro-Asiatic language's way of indicating that one should pay attention. Listen, oh, please listen to this. This word lahu is the ancient Afro-Asiatic's language's way of indicating that one should pay attention in the same way that one would pay attention to the approach of possible and probable danger. Isn't that what the shepherd is doing with his Shepherd's hook, his lamb, he's telling the sheep, whoa, pay attention. There are wolves in that direction. Get back from there. I, or I have to hook you around the neck because I see you being hard-headed, stiff-necked, and rebellious. Some of you remember that? Yeah, so I have to pull you back from danger. And then I have to point you and I have to prod you in the correct trajectory where safety and security is. So that's what that lamb connected to the ha, the opportunity. Hmm? That's what it means. 
One is being prodded and pushed in the direction of opportunity. That's what Allah does by allowing you to do all things that are higher, beneficial, good, safe, productive. All of that means higher in Arabic, higher. Allah says, I am higher and I accept only that which is higher. Wonderful when you understand it. interesting that i stopped exactly on the time 911 on my computer you can't make this up i always like to say that allah also has a sense of humor <laughs> but his humor is serious he continues to signal the human mind that is in sync with his will and purpose now The major danger in the environment of these ancient people was and still is the snake. The snake, when you see that snake in a position poised to attack, especially where it is supporting itself on its body and its neck region and head is up in the air and its tongue is flicking out. That says to the mind of the human, you better pay attention. This could be danger. So what is that saying? Pay attention to the opportunity. Now, the opportunity might not be on your side. It might be an opportunity for the snake to have an evening meal. Nevertheless, it is towards an opportunity. Let's look at it in picture form. The Arabic glyph, which came to be the title Allah, is the profile of a serpent. The serpent is symbolic of the unconscious mind, a.k.a. the instinctive nature, sometimes called the instinctive drives. Within you, all of what I'm discussing tonight is in you and me. The snake, when you read about it in the Quran, whether it's in the hands of Musa, whether it's in the hands of Fir'aun, Pharaoh, and his hosts, whether it's in the Bible in the form of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, wherever you find that sneaky snake, it's talking about your instincts. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, your instincts are hidden within you. That nature in you that makes you have to eat, have to sleep, have to poop, have to pee, that nature, the instincts in you, they're hidden in you. You don't even know how they're operating. You don't know what it is that makes you hungry. <laughs> Unless you're a scientist and you study like that. You have to be a chemist, a biologist to figure that out. Ordinary people, they have no idea why they even fear things and people and situations. Fear is an instinct. So that glyph that we call Allah is really just a picture of the snake that is poised to attack. And again, it's speaking about an activated instinctive drive. Look at it. Here's the Arabic glyph for Allah, Alif, Lamb, another lamb with a shedda, which makes it two lambs. That's three already. This first lamb, this lamb with the shed that doubling it, that's one, two, three lambs, as I said. And then the ha at the end, which is the serpent's tail. Once you know it, you can't not see it. You can't unring this bell. No, 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 he's seeing it stuck. He's seeing it. He gave us his name as a serpent. No, 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 no. You're not talking about what Allah did here. You're talking about what men did. You're talking about what the human minds came up with, not with what Allah did. The human mind came up with this based on its contact with natural properties and natural occurrences and all of those kinds of things. It's the human that sat down and said, we're going to scratch it out. We're going to etch it out <laughs> like this. They began doing that in ancient Sumeria with what is called cuneiform, scratching pictures in the clay. That's not new. 
and it's not a part of the instinctive uh, part of me. It's not a part of the intel the intelligence in you. The intelligence in you was able to communicate and get along just fine without written language. Written language is a byproduct of the intellect. I think I need to repeat that. Written language was not revealed per se by Allah. You were able to communicate quite fine, tribe to tribe and neighbor to neighbor before people developed writing skills. The writing was a requisition in the, probably in the soul of the human being for an evolved sense of expression, expressing oneself. So you had somebody maybe had a twig or something and they writing in the clay or in the dirt or whatever. And they, oh man, man, if I do this over and over again, maybe my wife will understand what I'm trying to say. I love you, you know, or whatever. You know, they're just etching in clay and, and that evolved to become future languages and different uh, expressions of what is called writing. But all writing has to do with symbols of things. Your Muslims don't follow symbolism. You've been following symbolism ever since you learned to read and write. What do you think these are? These are symbols. Now let's go back to something Imam Muhammad said that went over the heads of most Imams and probably most people who heard him say it. If they heard him say it, if you didn't, then here's your opportunity, your window of opportunity. Imam Muhammad said that in the masjid, especially during the Jum'ah, there should be no writing on the walls. Imam Muhammad said that in the masjid, not only should there be no writing whatsoever on the walls, he said, you should try when you come to Juma to not even have writing on your clothing, like your shirt or your pants, or even, you know, the, um, the manufacturer's name, name that they put on the bottom of your socks. Anything that people can see and cause them to become detracted from the message of the Quran that's being taught at that time. He said, you shouldn't wear it in the masjid. He said, even if on the wall is the name Allah. Now I know the excited ones in the rest of the Muslim world said that Astaghfirullah. How is he to say that you cannot put the holy name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the wall? Because the name of Allah is a sound partner. It's not a written script. You think Arabic is a script. <laughs> Where was the script when Muhammad started receiving revelation from on high? Where was his book? It was nothing but sounds being revealed to him that he would repeat in the public. And it was the sounds of these words from the Quran that brought about that level of transformation in those people at that time. But they have reversed the logic on us to make us think that it's the word and we have to spend this much money and this much time learning the writings of the Quran. So when we see them, we can repeat them by memory. Oh, this is an Aleph connected to Ba, connected to Tha, connected to Jim, connected to Ra. And, all, and we can read it all right. And we become half of reading the Quran, but we can damn show not understand what we're reading. And that is the travesty. And that is where the linguistic social manipulators, they called us by the testicles, excuse the expression. And they're still squeezing. So these fools haven't figured it out yet. It's not about memorizing scratches on a page. It's about registering the frequencies of the sounds and what those sounds mean in the intellect and in the heart. That's what Muhammad had that we've lost depending on scholarship to lead us, wayward scholarship to lead us. So this glyph is really just an artistic expression of what you see over here on the right side. Hmm? And that is the snake that is poised to strike. The snake is paying attention to something. The ancient Arabs invented this ligature by modifying an even more ancient ligature known in ancient India as Aum, sometimes called the O-M, Aum. You hear them when they do their meditations. Aum, 
however they do that, right? Whatever they do. Yeah, I think that's it, right? Um, that Aum is one of the most ancient sounds reverberating in this universe as we know it. It's the sound that eventually gave us the word for mother, as in mother earth and in mother universe, uni, yoni. Yoni is the ancient Sanskrit word, the same language out of ancient India for the womb. Yoni, that's the womb of the woman. And reverence or have taqwa for the wounds that bore you. You were born out of the universe before you were born or as you were being born, I guess, out of your mommy. You're born into the universe out of your mother's interior. So we're supposed to reverence not only our mother's womb, but we're supposed to reverence the womb that we call the uni or the universe also, which means what? You're supposed to pay scientific attention to what Allah has created because you're on a pattern of development that insists that you evolve, humanly speaking, not devolve, not go backwards, evolve in your behaviors, in your attitudes, and in your intelligence. So this is the ancient glyph for so-called God amongst the ancient Indian people. And to the right of it, as you can see, is a related set of patterns or shapes you can see it clearly, come on. This here is just this here. This here is just this here. And this here is just another way of expressing this. So if this is younger than this, then it's very possible that this Arabic glyph is based upon the ancient Indian glyph called Aum, Aum. And I was going to say that it gave us the word for mother, um, the source of all life forms, mother. See how deep these ancient people were? Don't dismiss them as being just pagan idiots. They were deep thinkers, as Allah asks us to be through his Quran. So Aum or Am symbolizes the universe and the ultimate reality. It is the most important Hindu symbol. This is them talking now. I'm just commenting or reciting. At the dawn of creation from emptiness first emerged a syllable consisting of three letters, A-U-M, often written as O-M, Um. AUM is considered an original or primal sound that rang out in the created universe. It is the root mantra, M-A-N-T-R-A. -A. Mantra is a word of great power. The equivalent of mantra, by the way, in the Quran is al-dhikr, al-dhikr. Usually mantra, that word, is a combination of Sanskrit syllables used as an invocation, prayer, recited loudly and repeatedly. The M-A in mantra means the soul or the mind. And the T-R-A in mantra means protect, lead. Among several mantras, there is one most important mantra, O-M, Om. It is considered A-U-M and represents the, listen, three aspects of God. The Brahma, that's the A, the Vishnu, that's the U, and the Shiva, that's the M. I presented these three to you as the cryptic meaning for the word God. The G being generator, that's Brahma. The operator, that's Vishnu and the destroyer, hmm? that's Shiva. Now you got more to work with. Here is the title Allah in the more ancient Kufic script before cursive script was invented for the ancient Arabs. Look at this carefully. This is the ancient Kufic, K-U-F-I-C script. A script, I repeat, which predates the cursive writing we have learned from modern Arabic. And by the way, 
proficient readers of cursive Arabic cannot read a Quran that is written in Kufic. It will be very difficult. But this is the Kufic that predated the cursive. This came before this. Listen carefully. This was the way Allah was written in Arabic before the ancient Arabs invented this, probably as a copy, slightly modified, of what they found on the walls and the temples and the writings of ancient India in their Hindu uh, lexicon. So that's Allah. That would be the alif. That would be the lamb, the lamb, and then the ha. Now we're going to talk about the sunnah of Allah, the S-U-N-N-A-H of Allah. Even when we do attempt to alter nature, Allah's sunnah, which is unalterable, steps in to save the proverbial day. In the Quran, the source creator's unchanging way is called his sunnah. Now there are several ayat from the Quran that substantiate what's being said. This is from the internet, so pay attention. Muslims believe in the oneness of Allah and abide by his book, the Holy Quran. The Quran does not use the term sunnah in the sense of way, the way or the practice of Prophet Muhammad. Do I need to repeat that really? The Quran, this is not me speaking. This is the scholars who contribute to uh, Quora.com. This person says, the Quran does not use the term sunnah in the sense of the way or the practice of Prophet Muhammad. So you got to ask yourself the question, well, where did we get it? Let's get into that later. So obviously nowhere in the Quran can one find, quote, the sunnah of Muhammad, end quote. The religion of Islam is a divine religion derived by the divine book of Allah, the Holy Quran, which confirms the previous scriptures Adhering to this religion is called the following the, quote, way of Allah, end quote, which means, uh, quote, sunnah to law, end quote. Sunnah to law, the way of Allah, appears in the Quran in various verses which have been manifested and commanded by Allah directly according to the will of the supreme authority. In other words, Allah substantiated this term. Allah did not substantiate the term sunnah of Muhammad. Let's continue. Almighty Allah stated in the Quran, there is no fault in the prophet in seeking what Allah has ordained for him. The way of Allah, sunnah to law is right here. The sunnah to law. Hmm? The way of Allah with those who passed away before. The commandment of Allah is a determinate decree. So Allah has ordained the sunnah of Allah, the sunnah to Allah, the way of Allah. Allah says, this is the way of Allah, the sunnah of Allah with those who passed away before and you will not find any alteration in the way of Allah, the sunnah of Allah. Allah says, you will not find any hmm, alteration Tabdilan, no alteration in the sunnah of Allah. It's beautiful when you understand it. Continuing, do they, the disbelievers, wait for other than the way of the ancients, but you will not find any alteration in the way of Allah and you will not find any change in the way of Allah. Isn't that beautiful? That's in Surah 35, Ayat 43. I'll begin mentioning the... Uh, uh, the ayat, let me do that so you'll know where to go when you actually study this information. The first ayat was from Surah 33, ayat 38. The second one was from Surah 33, ayat, ayat 62. 
This one that I read is from 35 IF 43. And this next one says, their faith did not help them when they faced our might. This is the way of Allah, the sunnah of Allah, which applied in the past to his servants and there the disbelievers lost. That's in Surah 40, Ayah 85. The next one says, this is the way of Allah, which applied in the past, and you will not find any alteration in the way of Allah. So what are all of these saying? They're saying that whatever Allah established in the past is the same exact way that he has ordained for the future and beyond. That was in Surah 48, Ayah 23. The next one says, this is the way or the sunnah of those whom we sent as messengers before you, and you will not find any change in our way. That's from Surah 1777. So if we're going to say that a prophet or a messenger has a sunnah, you have to say that they all, min rusulina, all of them had sunnahs. But the fact is, and we're really not understanding what the word Rasul is referring to. We think it's a physical messenger bringing a physical message, a book or whatever. Not necessarily, but we don't have time to go over that tonight. Suffice it to say that <clears throat> all human beings have a sunnah according to the Quran. Allah says he created us. Min hama'in masnoon. From stinky clay fashioned into shape. The word for fashioned into shape is masnoon, masnoon, M A S N O O N, means the place of ma sanun, sunnah, sinan, sunnah, the place of sunnah. Allah created us with a sunnah. You're born into this world with a traditional way of doing things. Whatever you do over and over and over and over ad infinitum becomes your sunnah, your traditional way of doing that. The way you eat, the way you sleep, the side of your body you sleep on, all of those things, the way you play, the way you laugh, all of those things are part of your traditional life. The way you engage your family, the things you do with or not with your neighbors, all of that becomes your traditional behavior. That's all sunnah is referring to. That which registers in the intellect as something that is good to do all of the time. That's what sunnah is, and every human being has it. Muhammad, along with all of Allah's chosen prophets, had that kind of exemplary behavior, traditional behavior. It's not distinct to Muhammad alone. Let's prove it. That was Quran 17, Ayah 77. Almighty Allah had chosen prophets and had given them his revelations of scripture. Among them, Allah appointed messengers who delivered the scripture of the Almighty to mankind. This is commentary, by the way. The sole duty bestowed upon a messenger of Allah was to deliver the message only. So when Allah says, quote, obey Allah and obey the messenger, end quote, it means that we are to obey the message of Allah, which was delivered by the chosen messenger. The messenger is like the postman delivering the mail. He's not responsible for what's in the mail. And the prophet is not responsible for the message that Allah uh, commanded him to deliver. Continuing, a messenger of Allah was never a lawmaker. This is all Quran that this man is quoting. A messenger, a Rasul of Allah, was never a lawmaker. These people who give you all of this other extra information tell you that Muhammad was making the rules, the regulations, the law, the sunnah, the way, do this, don't do that, uh, eat with your right hand, and if you eat with your left hand, you're a pagan. And they were the ones establishing all of these laws these man-made laws. It says, but he was obliged to deliver the law set by the creator, almighty Allah. That law was the sunnah of Allah. That law, the cosmic laws that should be obeyed, that never change. Quoting, continue. Almighty Allah didn't permit any of his prophets or messengers to impose any of their laws rather than the laws of Allah in the religion of Islam. 
his messengers were only tasked to deliver the Almighty's sayings to Muhammad, nothing else. This is back to the Quran. This is Surah 3, Ayats 2, 3, and 4. Allah, there is no deity except him, the ever-living, the sustainer of existence. He has sent down upon you, meaning he revealed to Muhammad, the book in truth, confirming what was before it. And he sent down the Torah, the Torah, and the Injil gospel before as guidance for the people. And he revealed the Quran. Indeed, those who disbelieve in the verses of Allah, meaning the ayatullah, the verses of Allah, will have a severe punishment. And Allah is exalted in might, the owner of retribution. So in essence, my friends, what is Allah saying? Clear. Indeed, those who disbelieve in the hadith, right? No, no, no. That doesn't say hadith. Hmm, let's see. What does it say? Oh, those who disbelieve. Bil ayati law. See? Bil ayati law. Those who are kufr with bil ayat, the instructing signs of Allah. Those who disbelieve, who turn kufr on the ayat of Allah, meaning the Quran itself, will have a severe punishment. It didn't say those who turn their backs on the hadith. The hadith are not called ayat. Only the Quran is to be called ayatullah. So those who are in for the punishment are those who turn their backs on the ayatullah in favor of the hadith of men. I want you all to hear this clearly and concisely. When you say, I follow the hadiths, even though the Quran says, do this, the hadith said, do it this way. And I follow the hadiths because I think they're from Muhammad, a man, a male, a man, a human, just like all the rest of you. So says Muhammad in the Quran. But I'm going to follow these men established by Bukhari and Muslim and Abu Dawood and all the rest. I'm all these men in history. I don't even know who these people were. I don't even know what their reputations are for me to just say, I'm going to accept what they say. Volumes and volumes of hadith. I got thousands of hadiths in my library. But Allah gave you one Quran that was sufficient. And he said it was fully detailed. What do you need with all that? Other? You're wasting space in your library. Yeah, anything you need to know from the hadith, you can just go online and look it up. You don't have to have all of these so-called impressive books in your background when you're giving your internet lecture. You think that impresses me? You'll never see Instructor Bilal with a bunch of books behind him when he comes online because I'm not here to psychologically jive you into thinking that I know all that stuff. The average one of you can't even read the Arabic on the front of those books of hadiths. I'm just telling it to you straight like it is. All right, continuing. Now the author says, now read and ponder upon the verses below to know about a messenger's duty. Now this is from Surah 17, Ayat 105 and 106, where Allah says, with the truth, we sent it down. Now, whoever you hear Allah saying he sent it down, or we sent it down, and zalnahu, and zalnahu, we sent it down. Nazala, he sent it down. It means that it came to you as revelation, not from one person to you. It didn't come from a human. It came from on high. So Allah calls it being rained down like rain, like the rain you heard earlier. It's rained down as revelation. And it has all of the necessary nutrients to spark life in you, just like the rain has the necessary nutrients to spark life in the dead earth. So with the truth, we sent it down and with the truth, it descended. We sent you only, listen, you wanna know what the tradition of Muhammad was and what his role was? This is Allah speaking to Muhammad. We sent you, Muhammad, and all prophets, only as a bearer of good news and a warner. That's it. 
a Quran which we unfolded gradually, not you through tafsir and examples to your companions and different ways of explaining what Allah said that Allah did not say. That ain't what we do. It's Allah speaking. Not what me and my fitra forces do. Allah said it's a Quran which we unfolded gradually that you may recite to the people over time. So the Quran's wisdom is a an incrementally progressive evolution of understanding, not something that they understood the best of back then. And now 1500 years later, we dodos can never catch up with what the, the companions of Muhammad understood. Not even with, with, with Muhammad. Un you think Muhammad understood all of what Allah, the Quran tells you that he was in a quandary over what was being revealed. It was too much for him. It was, this was new to him. And again, y'all get mad at W.D. Muhammad <laughs> when he gave that lecture. I think it was back in 1977 or so, where he said that Muhammad was complete as a prophet, but he was incomplete as an Arab. I think I better get up because y'all might start shooting at the computer. I'm gonna repeat it anyway. Imam Muhammad said that Muhammad was complete as a prophet, but he was incomplete as an Arab because it was his Arab self that was responding to activities in his immediate environment that was scratching his head about what Allah means by this or how I should handle this. So Allah has to reprimand the prophet from time to time in the Quran. Allah never ever reprimands what he calls a Rasul, the messenger in the Quran never reprimands the messenger. The only reprimanding of Muhammad that you see in the Quran is when Allah mentions him as a Nabi, the prophet, because the prophet was a social role. The messenger was a message role, the role of the message itself, and the message was pure and complete. Therefore, it needed no reprimanding. A Quran which we unfolded gradually. That is so beautiful. That you may recite it to the people, to Anas, over time. Wonderful message. And we revealed it in stages. Mm -hmm. Then Allah says in Surah 10, Ayah 15, and when our clear revelations are recited to them, those who do not hope to meet us say, bring a Quran other than this, or change it, change it. Say, this is Muhammad speaking. You want to know what his traditional way of doing things was? Listen to this, because it's clocked into the Quran. Say, that's Allah telling the prophet, say this. It is not for me to change it of my own accord. I only follow what is revealed to me. Now, what if I were to come in and say, well, we can change that to I only follow what is revealed to me and what my later Sahaba will tell you I said as Hadith. You kick me out of the club, wouldn't you? But that's exactly what Muslims in history did. Allah had the prophet tell you right here that I only follow what is revealed to me. Not what people will say I said 250 years from now. What is revealed to me as I speak is coming to me hmm? in increments. It's unfolding as revelation. Then he goes on to say, this is Muhammad still speaking. I fear if I disobeyed my rub, the torment of a terrible day. That means that if Allah, if he had come with anything other than the Quran, he would tremble that Allah is going to get me, if not now, later. Because my sole responsibility was to repeat and repeat that message, whether I understood it logically or not. 
It wasn't for me and my little day and time in the middle of somebody's desert. It is for the entire cosmos. Continuing. Uh, Surah 46, Ayah 9. Say, still Muhammad. You want to know Muhammad's words? Here they are in the Quran. And Allah said, this is the best of Sunnah. This, pardon me, this is the best uh, hadith. Asanul <laughs> Hadith. And Allah says, and what hadith will they believe in after this? <laughs> he said, I gave you hadith, my hadith from on high. Now you need the Bukhari's. Say, I am not different from the other messengers. In other words, don't distinguish me from other messengers. They do that every time they mention the man's name. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad, the greatest of all messengers. Where did you get that? That's not what Allah says. Allah says, make no distinctions between my messengers. And it's right here, another version of it. Say, I am not different from the other messengers and I do not know what will be done to me or with you. Don't stop asking me about, well, you the prophet, you should be able to predict what is going to happen to my family and the, the I, that ain't what I do. I just deliver messages. I'm just a postman here. Ask me what the weather's going to be tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> Continuing the quote. He said, I only follow what is inspired in me. And I am only a clear warner. See, whatever dawns on me is revealed on, uh, uh, unto me by way of the wahi, by way of the inspiration and the revelation. That's the only thing I follow. I don't follow my own whims and my own opinions of things. I only follow what Allah told me to follow. And I am only a clear warner. That's in Surah 46, Ayah 9. Continuing, Allah tells the prophet to say, I do not say to you that I possess the treasuries of Allah, nor do I know the future. Hmm? Nor do I say to you that I am an angel. I only follow what is inspired to me. Say, are the blind and the seeing alike? Do you not use your akal? Do you not, let's get the correct wording here. Yeah. Afala tafakkarun. Okay. Yeah. Do you not use what Allah gave you as thinking apparatus? Do you not use that which Allah created in you to examine logic? That's in Surah 6, Ayah 50. Continuing, Surah 7, Ayah 203. This is good for you. Just be patient. If you do not produce a miracle for them, they say, why don't you improvise one? <laughs> say, I only follow what is inspired to me from my Rabb, my Lord. These are insights from your Rabb and guidance and mercy for a people who believe. Commentary. When a prophet or messenger was asked about something or if they faced any argument, they were not permitted to solve any dispute or problem by their own methods or solutions. Regarding any matter, Almighty Allah provided the verses to the prophets or the messengers in order to solve the problem. So in other words, when there was a serious situation and a decision needed to be made, the prophet would zip his lip until he received revelation concerning that issue. He wasn't talking off the top of his own head like we do or like his Sahaba did and like these scholars do, talking off the top of their head, talking as they say, off the side of their neck. <laughs> Almighty Allah says in the Quran in Surah 25, Ayah 33, whatever argument they come to you with, we provide you with the truth and a better ex position. Allah says in Surah 66, Ayat 1 and 2, O Prophet, now he's addressing the Prophet. Yeah. Yeah, I you had Nabi. Yeah. Yeah, I you had Nabi on O you Prophet. Why do you Allah talking to the prophet. Remember, the prophet is dealing with social issues 
in a contemporary framework of experiences that he's going through personally. The messenger is the role that belongs to the world. The prophet is the role that belongs to a particular group of people. That's the other thing Muslims aren't aware of. And they might accuse me of midda if I keep talking along that line, but it's right here in the Quran. When Allah has the prophet saying something, it is advice for your handling of social affairs, family affairs, money affairs, community issues. That's what the prophet's role is, to show you the correct way to go when it comes to social issues, social values, and how to correct issues and upgrade values. But you don't have to follow everything he did as a prophet. He was a prophet to a particular people, but he was the messenger of Allah to the entire alameen. Rahmatul lil alameen. Trouble, 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 that instructor below. That's my middle name. And if it causes you problems, it's because you have a problem, <laughs> not because what I'm saying has a problem. Listen to this. Oh, prophet, why do you prohibit what Allah has permitted for you, seeking to please your wives? Allah is forgiving and merciful. Allah has decreed for you the dissolution of your oaths. Allah is your master. He is the all-knowing, the most wise. So what is Allah saying? He's saying, prophet, you're not the all-knowing and the most wise. When I reveal something to you, that's how you're supposed to get it done. Don't let your heart cause you to swerve away from what I'm instructing you to do because you don't understand all of its ramifications. I got control of that. We have revealed it and we will give the tafsir on what we revealed. So says Allah. Allah didn't leave it to Muhammad to give any tafsir. All these people tell me, I got the tafsir of the Quran. Come here and learn the tafsir of the Quran. How you got tafsir of the Quran when the, when the prophet didn't give tafsir on the Quran? He didn't give explanations, these detailed kinds of things that you're pointing out in the Quran. And he didn't do all of that. You can explain it, but that's not from you. You have to be in sync with the fitrah-based logic of the Quran and its letter system in order for you to be able to explain what Allah already explained through the fitrah. You're just exposing more of the fitrah, not your own ideas, more of the fitrah and its nuances. So that's Surah 66, Ayat 1 and 2. Continuing, this is Surah 6, Ayat 114 and 115. Shall I seek a judge other than Allah when he is the one who revealed to you the book, explained in detail? Fusalat, mufassala, huh? explained in detail. Those to whom we gave the book know that it is the truth revealed from your Rabb. So do not be of those who doubt the word of your Rabb has been completed in truth and justice. All right, so if the word of Allah is completed in truth and justice, then who are these people who say we need the hadith because the Quran doesn't give us the complete prayer or the complete way of handling this business deal? Or who are these people who are saying that the Quran needs an ancillary group of uh, bunch of information to explain it? because Allah didn't give you the details in the Quran. Allah says right here, the word of your Rabb has been completed in truth and justice. Then Allah says right behind that, there is no changing of his words. Hmm? of his words. He is the hearer, the knower. That's the Quran again. Surah 6, Ayat 114 and 115. Then Allah says, nor can you guide the blind out of their string. You can make no one listen except those who believe in our verses for they are Muslims. You hear that? You can make it talking to the prophet. You can make no one listen except, not except those who follow the hadith 
in the seerah, in the sunnah. No, you, meaning Muhammad, you can't make anybody hear you except those who have faith in our ayat, our instructing signs, given how? Through this revelation of the Quran in the Quran itself. So how are you going to tell somebody who don't want to follow your hadiths that they are not Muslims, they're not believers, quote unquote? Where's that in the Quran? The religion of Islam is derived from the book of Allah, the Holy Quran, which confirms the previous scriptures. This is not any single prophet's sunnah, but the sunnah of Almighty Allah, called the sunnah to Allah. That's the end of whoever wrote this. <laughs> That's the end of his commentary. So I'm actually going to stop because we're approaching the 10 o'clock mark and we're going to investigate part two of this, including the two short videos that I wanted to show you. But I think you got a nice dose of researchable information and that's enough. A little dab, a do yes, they say. But I want you to yet that dab, baru, that dab, I want you to deeply ponder what's been given to you from the Quran, especially. And inshallah, I'll speak one-on-one -on -one with several of you tomorrow. We have some wonderful things beginning to unfold for Nunetics Institute that you need to be made aware of because you're going to celebrate when you hear about it. Wonderful openings and victories that Allah is bringing about in increments. Great levels of intellect and sensitivity that's being brought to us in the form of new learners from around the world now. The latest being from Bangladesh. I will tell you what this gentleman said. He said, we would like to establish a Nunetics Institute here in Bangladesh. And they're ready to move on it yesterday. We're the ones who are not totally ready <laughs> because I told you I need instructors. And many of y'all are dragging your feet. Won't call me to say I'm confused about these letters on book in uh, page 76 in Nunetics. But how come y'all don't call me or at least email me or text me and say, instruct, I'm, I'm trying to really learn. Few of you do now, but not nearly enough for me to say I have qualified instructors in the event that they wanted 10 instructors to handle Bangladesh. Not that big a territory, but significant because they cover many other places in Africa amongst Africans. I mean, dark black skinned Africans in Bangladesh, not to mention other areas of India. And the beauty about Nunetics, the beautiful thing about Nunetics is that it is not quote unquote race specific. It has nothing to do with black people or white people or red people or yellow people or brown people. It has nothing to do with those artificial uh, designations for human beings. All you have to be to benefit from nunetics is be human because nunetics is a fitra-based linguistic science. That means that if you can identify with mother nature, you can identify with us. If you can look out your hut or your skyscraper window and see natural clouds and natural trees and stick your hands into natural dirt in your backyard, you'll understand what nunetics is attempting to teach you. That's all you need is to be in touch with nature. And it's really that simple. So I'll be looking for some calls tomorrow, not just from the regulars, from the people I never hear from. Who wants to say something about that? Someone trying to say something. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam. I don't want you to forget to let brother, um, my brother, um, Imam Adib say whatever it was he was trying to say earlier and you yeah. told him to wait till the end of the class. Okay. I actually was remembering, but I wanted to let that last piece of information out. Okay. But I like to slap the backs of hands when necessary. And, and, and the other brother said he had something to announce to us also. Mm -hmm. oh, alhamdulillah. Yeah, that's going to be William Safir. So we're going to let, uh, as soon as I officially close out, I'm going to ask uh, Adib, who's still with us, I'm assuming. Adib, are you there? Got to be quicker to draw, Adib. Are you still there? William Safir, are you there?
people having a problem getting back in let me close down the page and then i'll find you on the side and we'll deal with it then okay but for now understand we're going to enjoy the videos on uh tuesday i believe that's a safe day tuesday at seven o'clock we'll reconvene i'll send you a brand new link and we'll begin with the videos by dr ibrahim karim called the supreme energy and by Dr. Bruce Lipton called The Law of Attraction. Now, obviously, you can write these down and look at them on your own, but you're not going to get the benefit that you're going to get as I explain it while it's actually being shown. But these are the two videos that will be seen on Tuesday, along with the rest of the commentary that I have for you. So with that said, let me just take us out of the notes. And... Uh, I see Adib Abdullah, are you, you with us? All right, and I know he works hard. He was very tired when we started out. So I'll ask him to put it in the form of an email and we'll deal with it that way. And I'm not sure if, uh, I see William Sapphire. Can y'all not get in? Do I need to unmute your mics? Can you hear me? I can hear you quite clearly. Okay. I think they may be trying to get in. Sometimes they have a little problem. Uh, instructor, that was uh, Waleed. That's Waleeduddin who had the uh, information. Okay, I didn't hear him in the beginning, but if he has that information, yeah, he. I, he I'm always going to give him the end of the program until we do Atlanta because he's always got something great and new to tell us. But I, I do know that William had something to mention also, and I see his mic is uh, muted. So if Waleeduddin is ready, feel free to come in, my brother. Brother Instructor? Yes. While we're having that information shared, I've, I've put the uh, uh, flyer that was sent to me in regards to the uh, weekend event in Atlanta. Beautiful. Put on Facebook, and I'd appreciate if everybody who sees it on my Facebook page would mm -hmm. share it, let it go ahead and ripple out, mm -hmm. uh, as well as me contacting the other you know individuals I'm, I'm reaching out to. Great. We're going to have a... a we're going to have a nice article, inshallah, in the Muslim Journal in just a little while about that event in uh, Atlanta, GA. And uh, we're paying for some half-page ads in the Muslim Journal for a couple of weeks until the event on October 7th, 8th, and 9th of uh, October. It's going to be a wonderful expression of Nunetics joy. And so if you're in that area... Or if you can make it to that area, I understand that some people who might be a distance away are trying their best to make it uh, and be on that midnight train to Georgia that Gladys Knight and the Pips told you about. All right. They're going to be trying to try to be on that train, the, mid the midnight train to Georgia. All right. But you'd rather be in the Nunetics world <laughs> than to be out without Nunetics in yours. <laughs> That's right. I'm in Hold on. I see a nice crisp picture of Waluddin. Waluddin. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so that means you're ready. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, yes, sir. Um, some real exciting things are going on. Of course, uh, with the upcoming event in Atlanta on the 7th, 8th, and 9th of October. Truly excited. Uh, some wonderful things that are happening. Um, those of you who uh, have received the poster, uh, please, uh, on the bottom of that poster is um, the uh, Zelle and Cash App. Uh, we really want to make this, you know, top, top, top notch. And we are receiving um, donations coming in from all over. So please uh, feel free to um, respond, uh, we want to do, um, well, we have a lot of things that we're doing and we really want to make this truly a, a very, very successful event. And so we want to um, definitely thank uh, those of you who have responded already. Um, it, it is highly appreciated. Uh, the other thing I wanted to <clears throat> uh, just say, uh, the last two days I've, I've been attending uh, a event here in Atlanta called the Circle of e CEOs. Truly awesome event. And I'm gonna tell you, uh, they are ready for Nunetics. Uh, the, the energy, the, the frequency 
uh, that was in the room and what they were talking about in terms of words, in terms of uh, language. One of the uh, top producers, uh, uh, I think he calls his name Timberland, you may know him, um, was there. And um, I mean, what he was asking for is actually lunatics. So what he said, uh, what he expressed in terms of what his next level is uh, in terms of um, learning and in terms of language is really he was asking for lunatics. Um, I did have an opportunity to connect with and, and, and network with several individuals. Uh, we will probably be doing a, pro, a podcast uh, real soon with one of the young men that I had an opportunity to connect with, talk to him about Nunetics. He is ecstatic. He's excited. Um, and so, um, you know, with this, uh, it's truly our time. Um, and we are truly moving forward with this. And you will hear from me tomorrow, instructor. Um, I know one of the things that I got out of this weekend, um, we really have to be serious about genetics. We really do. And I'm talking about, you know, I know I made a personal commitment to up my game and up my study uh, to, uh, to commit myself um, to really mastering these skills because the, the world is waiting for this. I mean, this is really the salvation um, of, of the world for that matter. So um, we thank the law for you. We thank the law for this opportunity. Um, and uh, we're just pushing forward. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Habiba, can you come back on and just verbally give us uh, the email address for new people who might want to contact us and uh, learn more about the University Online Learning Course? Are you still there? Yes, I can. And what I'll be doing is I'll key it into the chat box as well. So this way they can uh, both yeah. see, have it visual. There, there are a sizable number of people who are in here by telephone. So if you can give it to them as well as put it uh, in. Yes, I sure will. Yes. Okay. Uh, the way that you can contact Brother Instructor, our international instructor, Benjamin Bilal, is through email at Cosmic Quran One, and that's spelled C. O S M I C Q U R A N, the number one at gmail.com. And I'll repeat that. That's Cosmic Quran, C O S M I C Q U R A N, the number one at gmail.com. Yes. And uh, excuse me. No, I said excellent. Oh, humbly. Continue. Do you want anything else? You want the, want the phone number to be given as well? Yes, you can give the phone number. Okay. The phone number where you can reach uh, Brother Instructor, either by text or by ringing his bell, is 516-300-2257. That's 516 516- 300-2257. And uh, as that, he told leave me- Leave a message. If I don't answer, leave a message and your number, and I yes. will absolutely get back to you. Yes. And uh, do like I do. Text him at three o'clock in the morning. So this way he wakes up to me. <laughs> Phone is turned down, so it won't bother me. <laughs> that's right. That's right, because you have all of your babies right down there with you, and I think that's fantastic. <laughs> you better believe it. You better believe it. Are there any new people here with us who'd like to just give us a shout out? Tell us who you are, where you're calling from, or make some comments about what you've been hearing or learning, and how you actually first heard about this program, this class, this uh, Nunetics experience. Anyone new? Relatively new. I see a lot of new names and numbers. None of you want to introduce yourselves if you haven't. Some of you did at the beginning of the program. If you have any questions or comments that you'd like to make, this would be the time to do it. And if not, it's all good. It's okay.
So Habiba has posted that information <clears throat> as far as my email address. And uh, I'm not sure if she put the phone number there, but if she didn't, she will. So with that said, uh, we're going to conclude, have fresh brains and fresh eyes and ears ready for Tuesday at 7 p.m. If you are not on my regular email list, it would behoove you to email me at the address that Habiba just gave you and ask for the link for Tuesday, unless you have a connect to somebody who has the link or will have the link. Um, I did put up uh, a YouTube video, a blast from my past from uh, the year 2009, and it was related to Adam and Eve equaling trends and fads, but I kept getting complaints from you, the group, and other people online uh, that it came out very, very muffled and distorted. It wasn't coming out that way if in my computer or on my phone, but because it was acting up in your ears, I removed it. So if you're wondering where it went, it wasn't the conspirators that removed it. Okay. <laughs> it I was, was wondering what happened. Yeah, it was moi. Yeah. So right. I, I'm probably going to do that same theme, but as a live uh, class broadcast in the near future, inshallah, because there was a lot of terrific information in that uh, comparison of Adam and Eve representing trends and fads. And that was from my human restoration center days that only Celia would remember because she was in my class back in 2009 in New York. I think she's the only one among you. No, Wali, I think we were still in contact probably that early, but she was in the physical class there in Queens, New York. So shout out to Celia for that. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So with that said, we're going to close out. Uh, by asking Allah to bless and protect us all, bless and protect our families, especially against all those who uh, seek to destroy what Allah has created as being acceptable. Those people who work behind the curtains, beneath the curtains, and out of sight to interfere with the integrity of the work that is being done here, Anything from this point on that is said about your instructor, Benjamin Bilal, or about the Nunetics method or anything, simply point those people in the direction of my email address or my phone number and tell them, well, whatever you're criticizing about instructor Bilal or about his method or about anything that you think you've heard him say in a YouTube video or whatever, why don't you just pick up the phone and call him? He gives his number every week. Now, when they respond kind of, you know, cuckoo and, and, and cross-eyed, when you tell them that, then you know you have an enemy in front of you. It's clear that you have an enemy in front of you who cares nothing about truth and establishing what is right. They only care about their own egos. And that day, like I said, we're at the end of that season, and those people are going to fade to black very soon. So it doesn't even, you know, it's not even worth your time to argue with them or to go back and forth with them. They're really not worth it. I don't care what kind of name they have in society or in the so-called community, especially of Imam W.D. Muhammad. It's not worth it. Just leave them alone. We're not a part of that. <laughs> that that's, that's bygone. All right. We're not getting paid by any people who are paying some of those people to stay in front of your faces and criticize me and other people. We don't get paid by them. So yeah, I yeah. respond and increase their pockets. And that is delusion. Based on people who just want to see people argue. I'm not mm -hmm. argue. I've never been a person to go back and forth with anybody about anything. There's no compelling in the deen. Truth stands out clearly from error. It's really that simple. So Allah says, so let those who want to have faith in this have faith. And let those who want to disbelieve and let them go on about their business. We ain't coming at you with no club and no bullies and, you know, gangs and all. You, it'd be about your business. Come you see us at Atlanta is what I'd like for you to do. You do come after them with some sharp knives, though. I got to say that. Say it again. You do come after them with some sharp knives, though. Well, it's all in the language. I can't help that. I don't have to waste time with them at all. Yeah, I can't help it. I get the language, I mean, you know, you stab yourself in the back when you pick up something from my arsenal. I'm not trying, I'm not aiming anything at anybody's back. <laughs> I'm not a backstabber. Mm -hmm. I'm a front loader. The pit, I'm trying the to load up your heart and your lungs for what's about to come as an inheritance for all of us. And all of us are in it. If you were here to enjoy that, man, 
that awesome information by Imam W.D. Muhammad for those 33 years that he was with us. If you were a part of that and you truly appreciate it, you're supposed to be with me on this journey, not against me. But if you want to be against me, that's to your own failing. That's to your own demise. Trust me when I tell you that you're going to fade to black like a season that is bygone and you'll be wearing your winter clothes, even though it's clearly summer outside. Maybe. Everything is growing around you, but you so masked up and hat down and coat on, you'll be looking like the typical hobo that has to carry <laughs> everything he owns on his back because he's really got nowhere to go. And we'd hate for that to be the fate of the people who say they support this language and logic. So please be reasonable, use your author yeah. and be sensitive enough to understand that all of us are in this together and none of us are gonna make it alone. It's really that simple. So I thank all of you. Is there anyone else I should say who has anything important that they want to leave with us tonight before we sign off? Feel free. Um, I'm uh, Shafika Abdullah from Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, I would just like to say it's going on six months since I've been attending uh, the, cl the classes. And I am just so uh, thankful because I feel like I'm, I'm back in school with my pen and legal pad. And it's better now that I'm retired. I've got all kind of time. I got two o'clock in the morning, two, three o'clock in the morning, uh, uh, it's, my time is just my time. I can just learn as much as I uh, learn all that I can learn. And I think of it as a continued earthly paradise. I call this my earthly paradise. Mm -hmm. And I'm being, I'm being blessed with this knowledge. And I thank you all. I thank you, Imam uh, Benjamin Bilal, for blessing us with this knowledge that Allah has blessed you with. It's all by the grace of Allah. So cool. Gave me the ability to learn it and to teach it. And that's a unique combination. A lot of people know things, but they don't have teaching abilities. And a lot of people can teach things, but they really don't know that much. So Allah gave me a double portion of his mercy in that regard. One thing I wanted to mention to you before the next person speaks is that if you've been listening to my conversations with uh, Dr. Omar Zaid, a brilliant intellect among us. <clears throat> He's offered me the opportunity. I've been listening to them. I've been listening to them. Very good. You mute your phones. Let me do it for you, just in case you forgot. Dr. Omar Zaid, who's a retired MD doctor. He's a doctor, doctor for real. Um, he's offered me the opportunity to partner with him as the host of a 26-week teaching program that is going to be centered in a city in South Africa amongst the Muslims of a particular community in South Africa. And it's going to be 26 weeks worth of exposition on the topic of what is truly monotheism. So I'm not gonna give you any more details except to say that I will be sending that information out um, hopefully by the time uh, this uh, email, uh, pardon me, this uh, video has been uh, edited. I will also be able to send in that email the advertisement for what myself and Dr. Omar are going to venture into beginning October 16th. So that's going to be right on the heels of us coming out of Atlanta, Georgia, because that's October 7th, 8th, and 9th. I'll get about a week's worth of rest, and then we're going to begin a 26-year journey which will also be on Sundays, but between, uh, I think, three and four, three and five o'clock. So won't interfere with the class. Well, then, but all of you will be invited to attend those South Africa sessions live. You be said 26 a year just now. Did you mean 26 a year or 26 weeks? It's going to feel like 26 years, but I meant 26 <laughs> yeah. weeks. Okay. Okay. Yeah, 26 hey. sessions. Yeah, when my brain gets tired, I, I, you need to correct me when I do that. You know what I mean, though, right? Yeah, so it'll be 26 years. It'll be 26 years of information and wisdom that we're going to share because this man is a wonderful intellect among us. That's Dr. Omar Zaid. He's just a wonderful, I call him an intellectual strategist because he knows how to, and I'll tell you in truth, 
one of his intentions is to, as we are introducing whatever subject matter he has to speak on, he has discovered a very discreet way of introducing nunetics into the conversation and therefore stimulating the conversation that much more in our, into our direction. He wants nothing more than to see nunetics become a worldwide phenomenon. He could have chosen from dozens of people that he knows to host that effort with him. And he chose your instructor. Doesn't that tell you something? And he tells you in those words, he tells you he's 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 a student of nunetics. Yes. He said, I am his instructor. Yeah. <laughs> he's a scientist. He can't learn. Yeah, it's wonderful. Ooh. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Now there was someone else I think who wanted to comment. I don't want to leave you out. Where are you? I I was just gonna say, uh, Shafika Abdullah. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say while watching the um minds coming together when he when he, when when dr uh, saeed presents the subject matter it's wonderful the way you complete the uh the, the information by using pneumatics and and other information yes and it's it's just really wonderful we're we're like zooming to the top you know and really, I'm doing it as a lesson. I'm doing it as a lesson for all of you instructors because <clears throat> our Monday morning meetings are totally unscripted. I don't even know what the subject is going to be until he appears on my screen. So I'm trying to show you how to be whatever that word is for just off the cuff, but still know what you're talking about. Impromptu. Impromptu. Uh, improvisation there are different words for it. absolutely hey, a, liquid yeah once you really consolidate the connections between these consonants every other word a person is speaking you're going to have a consonantal connection and a response it's really that simple it's the premier activating factor for any conversation consonantal connections i can take any word you give me right now. And my wife, she said, wait, do you really see consonantal connections in everything? I say, yeah. <laughs> no. and, and she's second in line for making these connections now. Don't sleep on my wife. She'll be speaking in Atlanta also. So you'll see how she's able to connect pneumatics to the health and wellness profession. Because she already knows that the word health comes from halal. And, and that's all she needs, right? So we're going to stress this out. Yeah. Halal gives you heal and it gives you health. All right. Instructor. Yes. Uh, I just like to remind um, all the learners that are in the Atlanta area, if they possibly can get on that um, uh, Wednesday night, seven o'clock call, because um, we are really ramping up to. You have the number. This and you have the number that, that Habiba can put in uh, now. Do you have the number that I'm uh, can put? Yes. Uh, let me pull it up off my phone. All right. Habiba, be ready to write. Oh, and also, Wally, while I'm at it, uh, make sure that you send me whatever information needs to go out to the whole group. Yes, sir. Right. So I can we'll email that information out, including whatever the flyer is or whatever you have that's email ready. And email yes. Ready. I want to yes, be able sir. to send that out. We'll to do that. Okay, we'll do that. Let me pull that number up. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Uh, remember you told me this year after? Mm -hmm. I was looking for you earlier. You disappeared. <laughs> it, 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 uh, uh, it, it was about the Shahada. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, as noted, after saying Shahada, then all your sins are forgiven. We found we as a collective mindset, Quran. 39 to 52 to 54. Most point out Quran 39, 53 as evidence. However, there's no connection so, to substantiate this. I will do more due diligence, but I wanted you to, uh, to, to let you know that again, there's no link taking shahada and all your sins are forgiven simultaneously. Yeah, thank you with that. What I would ask you to do in the next class, which is going to be on Tuesday, as I mentioned, Tuesday at seven, we're going to do follow up to tonight's information. So at the beginning of that class, I want you to read those actual ayat. 
Okay. So we can see how there's no connection. Okay. Even though the scholars are saying this is why Shehada gets rid of all of your sins, but it's not in those verses, and we need to know that concretely. So you begin Tuesday's class, you'll open up, and then you go right into those ayat and show us how it's not substantiated, if you will. That's okay. I found that, that it's a lot of bait and switch, and they they do it with the with the hadith and say the prophets say it. <laughs> well, you're going to bring that to us so that we can see it clearly. Yeah. Okay. No right. problem. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, Wally. Thank yes. you. Yes. The, the phone number for the seven o'clock uh, Wednesday night uh, call for the learners in Atlanta or anyone that want to join 978 990 5066. Again, that's 978 990. Five zero six six, and the pin is three five three three one zero pound. Again, that is three five three three one zero pound. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Bayina will send that to me in an email when we're finished. Seven thirty, Wally. I'll send that out. I'll make sure. Yep. That you send yes. That to Thank me. you, brother. Seven thirty. Yes. Thank you, Zik. And Wally, remind yourself to make that same announcement on Tuesday. Yes, sir. So that the next day when the call happens, whoever mm -hmm. didn't hear it today will have access to those numbers. We'll Thank do. you. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else before we close? Yeah. Salaam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Zay Muhammad, I heard someone else last time. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We just can't see you. Okay. I'm up. I'm... It's all, it's all right. Okay. No. Just let yeah, me know we can't I, mean, I just wanted to mention that there's another verse, but I can mention it later. I don't have to do it now that you no, hurry if it's on your soul to do it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, sure. it's, uh, verse is chapter seven, verse 157 and 158. Habiba, can you write that down, please? And say what I like about that. Is I'm sorry, say it again. Repeat it again so she can okay, put it in. A chapter, a sort of seven. Verse 157 and 158. He's got it. In that particular surah, it also mentions the prophet, the rasul, tabi'un, to follow that, and tells you where to look at the, you know, to take you back to the, the previous scriptures that came before. And this is how, it, it actually mentions how to follow the prophet also, so in those two verses also. Thank you for that. So we have researchers that are going to get busy at looking at those ayat. And uh, if any of you have commentary on that, feel free when we open up this subject in the beginning of uh, Tuesday's class to make your contribution. Thank you, sir. And by the way, Zay doesn't know it, but he's going to be one of our first official ambassadors of Nunetics, and he may very well be traveling outside of the country to represent our interests. <laughs> My yeah. passport is still good. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And, Where and, and, my man uh, Zay at? Where my man Zay? You know, well, don't worry about where Zay is because he might be side by side with you because you're the other person I had in mind for being, <laughs> if, if you have the freedom that Zay has, you'll be the other standing ambassador of Nunetics that will be traveling across seas to represent our interests. Got awfully quiet there. <laughs> no, but this is this, yeah. You, you, you got me. These these are the uh, the blessings that uh, uh, that uh, we have now. That is uh, beyond our wildest dreams. Now we're not we're not any we're not uh, at the footstool. You know we're at the table now. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And don't be surprised when you see new netics go into Ethiopia oh, and, and set up the ethics. first official and independent school system. Mm. A new president already told Abu, uh, Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. that's the name of the neighboring nation. Yeah. Wealthy, wealthy nation who wanted to come in and establish their schools for them. And the president said, nah, we ain't doing that. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So imagine now when we send our proposal stating that nunetics will cause them to be an independent learning effort that's going to shine a light all of the way around the world when people see that it's bringing these people up even out of poverty because of their intellects and what people are going to be coming to them for because of what Allah is going to be bringing out of the intellects. You remember the young African brother that came out of Seattle alone that we had for a minute at the beginning of the COVID situation. You see how brilliant he was? He couldn't have been more than 20, 21, 22 years old, but he was totally captivated. And it's because of what I believe now that the frequency level at which Allah has gifted me with being able to convey is actually opening up in degrees people's pineals. That's what I believe. I believe it's opening up your pineal gland and you're beginning to say things and, and come up with things and come up with a reasoning that you knew you didn't have prior to your introduction to nunetics. Ask Dr. Omar about his son, Mahdi. He will tell you and his mother will tell you. His mother will tell you. I, I, it's only been six classes that you've had with him and he's, he's almost a new child in terms of how he thinks. As one child, an 11 year old, imagine when Allah starts to let hundreds and thousands. That's why I need all of you to be on your P's and Q's. All right. I shouldn't have to say that every week. You should be yeah. calling me by now saying, I'm ready, instructor, or what do I need to get ready? Or help me get ready, instructor. You got 20 minutes for me today, or tomorrow, or Friday, or midnight, or whenever. I know the instructor's up to about two in the morning every night. <laughs> So you, I'm not going to reach out to you anyway. You have to reach me now without feeling any kind of funny about disturbing me and all of those other phony excuses that you give. I told you the only time you disturb me is when I don't hear from you. Ask uh, Salim Muhammad. He calls me almost every day. Ask, uh, uh, um, boy, we got, a, we got a few people here who call me. They make it their business to call me every day just to see how I'm doing, see if I'm still alive, if I need anything. And they pick my brain for a minute. I had a quick question for your instructor and so and so, you know. So these are people who I love that. So learn to be like that. Winona, she used to do that. She's gotten a little busy, but I'm looking to hear from her. Zaid, he's another one. I'm going to be putting his uh, lecture that he gave a couple of weeks. I have some more things for you. Pardon me? I have some more things for you. <laughs> who is that? I'll email you. I have some more things for you. Who, who is that talking? Winona. Okay, there was something in the background. I couldn't hear you. You said you had what now? Yes, I have some more questions for you. They're coming because, and actually in this particular presentation tonight, mm -hmm. you answered some of the questions that I had posed to you on Salah. So I want to thank you for that. But well, I want to thank you for your future uh, role in being the first uh, female ambassador. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Genetics. <laughs> Just to let you know what's coming. Benina also is going to serve a very important role on the technical side of establishing genetics around the world. Ezekiel is another one, going to make a great ambassador. So you're going to be moving up from being executive senior instructors and all of that. And pretty soon you'll just be ambassador to genetics. I don't know if it'll get any better than that for you. Kareem Abdul Salam, he's another quiet storm just waiting to be hatched. <laughs> this man is a, he's a tremendous power in terms of his ability to explain genetics. And he's not, you don't even hear from him that much. Kareem Abdul Salam. I know where the gold is. Bashir is another one. He's been sitting in the cut for years, even before he officially joined, but he's ready, like most of you are ready. And he says she's creeping up from the rear. She's going to be there in a minute. Got some quiet storms. Naima from Brooklyn. It's just a minute. Habib, but she already know where she stands. She's going to be all over the place. She's going to be stretched so thin. She's going to call us a bubble gum. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to scare her. Habib, she, <laughs> she wears so many, I like to say hats. I guess I can say she wears so many chimars, right? She's just everywhere for all occasions, every time. If I'm in her city, she's there, Philadelphia, New Jersey, whatever. I don't think she's missed a beat in the years that I've been teaching. She's one of the top learners 
and now top instructors in Nunetics. And everybody's going to be graduating. As soon as I get a chance to take a breath, I'm going to promote everybody except for the very, very, very new people coming in. So hold on to your chemas and kufis. <laughs> it's about to happen. So thank you all. I'm not a hijabi. You know what I'm saying? Oh, they absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> absolutely not. I'm looking at Ramzadeen. He's over there in the cut trying to be quiet. He's another one that's going to make a wonderful representative, international representative for Nunetics. And if I haven't named you by name, uh, you know I'm looking at you. I see you. And it's just a matter of time before you blossom. So don't worry about it. Chafika already, obviously, <laughs> is going to be one of the premier people. And uh, Wali Adin, he's already on the case, along with uh, Khalil Sultan and Fida Bayad, all of them. They're already in the front of the race. So it's a wonderful, wonderful time for us. William Safi is going to be doing some wonderful work. He and I are about to uh, venture into some podcasting, professional podcasting. And William has made a substantial investment in the equipment, which is on par with anybody online that you see doing professional podcasting. Allah has blessed that man and he's come through like a champ without bragging, without boasting, with no fanfare. He just gets stuff done. And that's what I like. Plus, he's an adequate representative in terms of his insights into what Nunetics is. So we're on our way. I'm letting people know this who are listening on YouTube that you can be on this train, but you need to get on before the doors close. That's all. And you can do so by calling that number that was given out earlier or by emailing that address. I hear now from people all over the planet wanting to join the class, wanting to buy the books. That's the first. They don't ask about prices. They say, how much? Send me your book list. And you got people ordering five books at a time, sometimes 10 books at a time. And then the next week, they order another five mm -hmm. until they get all 19. And some of these numbers that you see that say guest, 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 if you're seeing the numbers like I am, those are people from out of the country very often. So I want you to be aware that if you've been with me for a while, you need to show me that you're with me by being active. This is not a passive sit in the bleachers kind of experience, Nunetics. This is hands-on, hands-on. And I'm doing it for your benefit and your family's benefit because pretty soon you'll even be bringing in passive income just from teaching through modules that are already, you don't even have to be online live now. You'll be sitting at home or on the beach. <laughs> you know what I'm you like. said that before. <laughs> yeah. I hope you're not. I hope you won't be sitting in the mash yet arguing with people. Just go, no. go, go take a vacation and yeah. you'll still be making a decent living just from you establishing your own learning modules with your voice and face on them that people will just ching ching go online and register and then download it. And every time they download it, you get paid. What's wrong with that? I'm not spooky. I can talk about nothing. money. It ain't evil. Nothing. 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 It is real. Nothing. All right. And that's it how we're going to propel ourselves forward. If, if one person in Bangladesh says, mm -hmm. I want to establish Nunetics Institute in, in Bangladesh, he's talking about a physical institute. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to establish an institute for Nunetics in the United States. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's cuckoo. That doesn't make sense. I invite that's the Iqra Muhammad Consortium mm -hmm. and all of those brilliant minds that they've been mm -hmm. having work on a curriculum for our interest for all of these years prior to Imam Muhammad's passing. I invite that consortium to reinvestigate the Nunetics mm -hmm. method. If it's mm -hmm. getting this kind of fanfare from outside of the country, from people who never heard of Imam Muhammad until I mentioned him in a YouTube video, and now they're asking about Imam Muhammad. Who is he? They're doing mm -hmm. their own research into Imam Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here we are. We say we accept his language and logic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we won't give Instructor Bilal a call back to say, maybe there's something more than what we thought this was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you explain it to us again? That's mm -hmm. the call I'm waiting for. Mm -hmm. because I would feel really strange taking this system to a foreign country. And this system, they want to ask the natural question,
do you have a new Natick's Institute in the United States? The Clara Where's Muhammad the School. I heard about a Clara Muhammad School that W.D. Muhammad is in. Is your, is your curriculum in the Clara Muhammad Schools? I'll feel off. I wouldn't even answer the question. I just give them those people's phone number. Yeah, yeah. What is that all? A person is not honored in his own place? Well, they say that, but I think we can break that spell. Yes. Because again, yeah. the people in the Clara Muhammad School Consortium are good people, great yes. people. People who have been working at that to no end for no money. It's a commitment to the language and the logic of Imam Muhammad. But mm -hmm. we just need to break out of the tribal thing and break out of the yeah. petty jealousy thing. Once we get past mm -hmm. that, man, we're going to be making so much progress mm -hmm. because this inheritance that Imam Muhammad left is for all of us. It's not just for me and you. And it's, right. it's, it's for everybody. That's right. They love the man and love what he taught and stood for and all of that. And if they can just get past the idol worship thing of a man, <laughs> you know, just get past the idol thing that, that, that he's more than a human. That's it. Just get past that. And that's yeah. when Allah's going to open up the gates. He's going to open up the gates for you to make your progress. As soon as you say, I'm not going to follow you, man, Muhammad's language, like I'm in a cult. Mm. That's, that's, that's right. That's right. That's right. I'm not going to follow him like he could do no wrong and he's never said anything incorrect. That's when right. He himself that's comes behind himself to correct what he says. That's right. About a lot of subjects. Mm -hmm. Don't get mad at me if I bring up a something, a slight correction in some word he used or some phrase that wasn't in the Quran. There's somebody who just told me I have to investigate it to see if he's correct. He pointed out some ayat that I used that he said, well, the Quran never said that. The Quran never said that, uh, you know, Allah destroys a people or something like that who leave off the salat. I'm not sure how he phrased it. I'm not really sure how I phrased it. I might have been just paraphrasing. But I didn't say, oh, look at this enemy trying to come against. No, I'm saying I need to go investigate. And then if I'm incorrect, I need to send him an apology. Say, thank you for correcting me. Now, when we get that kind of disposition, I don't ask him what school you, what school of thought you're in or nothing or what ethnic group are you from. Irrelevant. It's totally mm -hmm. irrelevant. We have to get to that point where we treasure the human content, whether it's yeah. a, a white looking doctor or a you understand what I'm saying? Or whether it's yeah. a Pakistani looking or Egyptian looking or, or you know, Igbo tribe looking. That, that has nothing to do with truth. That's right. All right. So when we get beyond the facade, beyond the superficial and the artificial, that's when Allah is going to open up the gates of his mercy to us. And we will have. The greatest thing that Allah has created is the Akko. That's right. I, I, it, I'm always reminded I've, I've, I've made you nations and tribes not to despise each other, but to learn from each other. 49, right. 13. You know, we have oh, an opportunity cool. here to open up doors that, that and it's funny that, that we are being blessed. You know, the, the old Negro now is opening, opening doors and avenues for people to come and, and see our reflection on, on, on matters that, that uh, uh, previous scholars have overlooked. They, they didn't, they settled, you know, like, like the, uh, uh, it was said from into a cult. You know, we, 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 we've said, uh, we have a herd mentality, you know, most of us, because that's what I heard with, we, they didn't do the due diligence that uh, that uh, international structure Benjamin Blau was talking about. You see for yourself. He says, "Don't believe me. Go check out. So go check this out for yourself. And if it is something, come back to us. And we'll make the correction if if it's incorrect. We're going to make yeah. that correction yeah. because we want the information to be as pure as we can deliver it. Yes. 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 This has nothing to do with personal ego. We can't no on that level. So you know, um, uh, on that, uh, what uh, Imam Adib was just mentioning, and I'm not sure whether it was uh, Brother Mukmin or where he was commenting on something that Imam said or the Imam actually said it, but when he was talking about get to know, uh, Imam was saying that get, coming to accept was another way to look, really look at that uh, uh, I yet because uh, coming to accept is mm -hmm. um, is is strong stronger 
um, connection with what the what that ayat is talked about. Okay. That was several years ago. Yeah, the word that is being used in the Quran for coming to accept or getting to know one another is the word li ta'arafu. Ta <laughs> ta yeah. The mm -hmm. lamb of intensity, li ta'arafu. Mm -hmm. But ta'arafu is mm -hmm. from arafa. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. arafa, as I mentioned last week, is one of several words that is used for to know a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have the word shara. I'll give it to you again. Shara, mm -hmm. shin, ain, ra. Those are the letters you need to look up for shara. Mm -hmm. Then you have arafa, ain, ra, fa. Mm -hmm. Then you have ilm, ain, lam, mim. Now, what do all three of these words have in common? What letter do they all have in common? Aleph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Aleph. It's not Aleph. And what does Ayn mean? I, 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 straining, straining of the eye. Ah, the straining of the eye. Yeah. Insight. Yeah. insight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. so all three mean to know, but look at how all three of them include words that indicate vision mm -hmm. and insight. But they are insight on three Different consecutive levels. levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy to with Shara. Shara is related to a word that means the hair, H I I R. Mm -hmm. See? Because it's referring to sub rooted knowledge. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah unconscious yeah. mind. Mm. Arafa means to know things on their surface, but not mm. deep inside, mm -hmm. on the surface. So when you go to Mount Arafa during the Hajj, you are recognizing people because they're in their traditional clothing. Mm -hmm. You don't really know that culture. You only know they're from Ghana or they're from uh, Pakistan because of the exterior clothes. Mm -hmm. so it's to know something, but on the surface, see? So look at this. Shara means to know something from beneath the surface, mm -hmm. subrooted, mm -hmm. right. unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. Now, Arafa means to know something on the surface mm -hmm. as the surface is presenting that to you. And then the ilm, ein lam mean, means to know things cognitively and scientifically. Mm -hmm. You see those three levels? Mm -hmm. Unconscious. Yeah. Subconscious, mm -hmm. conscious. Yeah, that's the beauty of this uh, language. Reptilian, mammalian, and neocortex. Neocortex. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. Together. All right. Oh man, yeah. we begin to establish a cogent curriculum. Yeah. All we can say to the world is watch out because the yeah. American academics and school system, as you know, is kaput. There's nothing they can do to put that mm -hmm. back together. What's that uh, nursery rhyme? Mm -hmm. All the king's horses, you know. You know, you know, Humpty Dumpty. Dumpty. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Humpty Dumpty, was, Dumpty, all, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Great fall. Yes, all yeah. the king's horses and all the king's horses. Yeah. Back together again. Put him to together again. Hey, but but uh, but a, but a lot can. <laughs> yeah, but you know why he's an egg? Because he represents ego or ego. Ego. Yeah, it's the ego of the leadership. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They sat, yeah. On a, they sat on the platform of dividing people from one another on a wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. they base their platform on Republican, Democrat. You follow black people, white people. Yeah, yeah. that day is. Over. over yeah and so whoever's yeah. sitting on that wall as a as an authority <laughs> you know and, and it's right now having a great fall yeah right. you know, fall is and, a change of season right fall is a season yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. and no, what is interesting horses, about what listen, you're saying is listen listen, listen 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 mm -hmm. all of the king's horses military mm -hmm. and all of the king's men the academicians Right, couldn't put that fragile ego back, back together. together again. Again, mm -hmm. so we're coming with something stronger than personal mm -hmm. ego. Mm -hmm. The whole Western academic 
world actually is based on the fragile ego of the European. That's true. And yeah. his history. That's true. All of that, it is his is his ego. That's true. That's true. And he'll lie just to defend his ego. That's true. He, that's right. If we that's know true. what he did to the American that's Indian, the Native American. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. He cried tears in the middle of the night over what happened to them and what happened to uh, other people whom he just uh, just vanquished. That's right. Uh, and took their stuff, just ganked them yeah. for that stuff. <laughs> ganked them for their women, raped their women, left for smallpox and all that. Man, if we really knew the history of how this thing got established, it would make us yeah. cry tears. But yeah. today it would be tears of joy because we understand that Allah is fulfilling his promise to replace the corrupt with the uncorrupt. Yes. And it's in the language, it's not in the race or the people or the ethnic. Right. Not, he's not replacing white people mm -hmm. with black mm -hmm. people. That ain't what Allah does. Mm -hmm. Allah replaces lack of quality with the purification of quality. And if you step into yeah. that purification spotlight, then you get elevated no matter what your so-called race is. Yes, no right. That's right. Is, That's no right. That's what your right. nationality is. Step into the nunetic circle. And That's you right. Protected by That's Allah and his angels. Trust That's me. Right. That. That's right. That's right. Alhamdulillah. All right. So we have to close out. But All right. a couple of other people okay. who wanted yep. to put a tail end on something they were yeah. saying. Go ahead. We just did. A couple others. Alhamdulillah. It's Muhammad uh, El Sabrante. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I just wanted to make a yeah. I just wanted to make a point. Imam Muhammad, he would always talk about uh when he would talk about recognition, he was saying it's not about me, it's about us. So this is a plural thing. That's right. This is plural. This is not singular, this is plural. That's right. Yes. In terms of respect. All our inheritance. But Allah Lord. also says, as a reminder, Allah also says that your death and resurrection is as one, one soul. That's right. right. So if you think we means you don't have to listen to me, you're shooting yourself in the foot. <laughs> and yeah, I know yeah. Muhammad doesn't think that. I'm just talking yeah. to people out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. Allah never, never puts anything together depending on the majority of people to, to right. make it what he wants it to be. He mm -hmm. always sends the quality information through a person and then he replicates it. See, min nafsin wahida, one soul, yeah. and then zawjaha, her mate, and then batha mm -hmm. huma, see, jalun wa kathirun, see. And when he said, he always sends it through one nefs first. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Now, as far as nunetics is concerned, I happen to be that one nefs. Nefs and alhamdulillah, that's alhamdulillah. what I do. Yeah. You as a group are zaljaha. You're coming mm -hmm. out of the wahida that yeah, Allah yeah. has me to establish. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. the people that you touch in Bangladesh and Seattle mm -hmm. or Egypt or wherever the people are coming from, they become that uh spreading forth many men and women yeah 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 and Muhammad yeah. was the same way he became he in his time he was nefs and wahida yeah he was coming with something new that wasn't what his father was saying right yeah. that's right, that's right. And then from yeah, him yeah, he yeah, got yeah, the yeah. necessary help the the community life of the society uh, who supported him they were zaljaha they were out of his nefs they were reflecting his language and his sentiments and then out of that he's got people around the world now of all stratas that are promoting his language and logic it so I'm like, and isn't over. this funny when it, when uh prophet muhammad said that uh there will come a people that hadn't seen me and love me more than you mm -hmm. now we're going to transfer that to this time you know uh speaking iman wafi muhammad was that was that uh, energy that produced so forth and so forth, people like yourself, and then where the tab tabunes and that and that found that logic to the conclusion? It's it's just how how I'm not saying history repeats itself, but the destiny of Allah's uh, word being works being done on earth as it is in heaven if you if i can use that that so well, let me let me say this since this is a class and we're supposed to be learning with no egos attached yeah if what you're saying cannot be directly traced back to what allah says not what the prophet said yeah okay okay, okay. 
if it okay. cannot be traced back, then we should dismiss it or just put it on the side as something interesting. Erase it. And there's nothing in the Quran that says that the people of yeah. this time, that these are the people that Muhammad long to be with because they will follow me better than you guys are following me. I know we like to think that because we're living in the latter times and we weren't <laughs> here for Muhammad's direct time. And I, I know that's a strong hadith and a lot of the latecomers in Al-Islam, they like to feed on that one. Well, see, you know, we follow the prophet, although we didn't see him, they were right there and they were able to see him. But it doesn't mean that you are stronger in faith or in practice than those people. Sure. There's many reasons why the people who are directly with a person will be better than you. Many reasons for that. <laughs> like there's many reasons why a family that grows up together, why that son will help his father better than the grandson might help that grandfather who's dead now. <laughs> he just got the directives. But the grandson is not under the pressure of, you know, dad looking over his shoulder, asking him questions about his lack of quality in his work. No, we cannot say that the direct people under Muhammad the prophet called Sahaba or companions. We're not saying all of them were super duper righteous, but we're not going to be the ones to look into their hearts to say that uh, we, are, we are better in, in the history of this deen than they are, because many of us are faking and frauding our way through this deen. And only Allah knows anyway. So yeah, well, we, we leave that to Allah. Only Allah knows. Only Allah can see what's in the heart. So we don't, I dismiss that hadith from this point on. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't, and I know you're intelligent enough. But know. you know what? Not to hold that's you. That's just up. like somebody. That's just like somebody who says to you, "I love you more." I can't stand that. How are you? Doing? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? See, that that's very uh, irritating to me because they don't know the extent of my love. Okay, <laughs> they don't know the intensity of my love. I, I had to explain that to a sister the other day. She said to me, "Habiba, I love you more." I said, "How do you know?" <laughs> You didn't like that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, Abdullah, you were going to say something. I'm going to have to let you have the last word. No, you made it so clear when we talk talking about a human person, human people that come in the name of Allah. You said the prophet versus the messenger. If people is only clear on that yeah. alone, they get a better understanding of what the book is about. Yeah. Of the Islam, Christianity or whatever. Yeah, important to consider. Versus yeah. the prophet. One was directly the message of Allah and the prophet brought the message to the people, his people, his immediate people. Is that right? Enough said. I concur. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's get up out of here. Well, it's still okay. relatively early. <laughs> All right. Today, huh? All, right. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, we love you all. And don't say you love you. Love you, you also. Love you back. That's right. right. I love you. I love you. Turn. Yeah, we love, I love all you. All right. And, uh, and that's a wonderful that's experience that we will continue, continue blessings on this, on this journey. Sure. All right. Well, we're, we're, we're stepping over each other now with our voices. Slow down. <laughs> we all get the message and with that said as soon as this cooks I'll have it up on YouTube inshallah if it's not late in the night and um, we'll see each other on Tuesday at 7pm I'll send out the new link inshallah all of our participants and all who wanted to participate or all who participate via YouTube and other tubes pretty soon we're going to have our own tube with our Please. own name so, with that in mind, thank you for listening. Salamu and alaikum to you all. Well, like, wow. 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 Wow.